Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to order. Welcome everybody here in the council chambers and welcome I'm everybody out there in the computer land. Um, if you don't mind, uh, mute uh, your, your we start computers yet? until you're going to talk. No. And then, uh, when what y'all doing? Taking a nap? Yeah, we've started. I just called it to order. <laughs> I see Lee now. I see. I think I see Kevin there with him. Yes, is Kevin. You, is your mic on? Well, go yes, get your cattle is. prod and get him in there. Can y'all hear Lee? Can y'all hear me? Can you hear us at all? Ken, can you hear me? Wave your hand if you can hear me. Rebecca, can you hear me? We've got everybody but Holly, I think. And me. They can't hear either one of us. Ken, can you hear me? All right, see you, man. Ken, can you hear us? Can you hear me now, Ken? I see you in the top left. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, Rebecca, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right, here we go. Number two. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here in the chambers as well as in computer land to our June 1st Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Um, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from our last meeting. And Emily um, t told Lee? me that Art Dias has. Yes, sir. Lee, could you humor me and just call the roll so we can establish a quorum? Oh, sure. That would be great. Uh, do you have a – what else I can do? I'll go ahead and make sure I do it in order. Otherwise, I'm going to say somebody's name three times and miss somebody. Um, Art Dias. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Rebecca Bryant. Present. Harry Kohler. Present. John Worsham. I see you there. Was that John Worsham? I yes, didn't sir. hear it. Uh, that, that's you. You're present. I'm here. Uh, Holly. Here. And Richard Peterson. Here. Clarice. Here. And Kevin Boone, I see down there. Here. So we, we've got everybody. Thank everybody. you, Ken. Um, first item on the agenda are the uh, minutes from our last meeting, May 4th. Um, I was told by Emily that you have a couple changes, Art. I do. Uh, one thing that I failed uh, as I was looking at the minutes a little while ago, one thing I failed to mention when I made a motion for uh, the, uh, the what was it called, uh, water, water, watershed? Watershed, yeah, for watershed. First item on the agenda was at the uh, at the time I made a motion to deny. I failed to actually make a uh, a specific uh, reason or give a specific reason as to why that is. And I would just like to clarify that 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 had to do with self health, safety, and welfare of the public is why I felt like it was not appropriate. All right. Thank you, Art. Uh, um, any other changes need to be made to the uh, to the minutes from our last meeting, which was May fourth? If not, I'll accept a motion. So moved. Art dies. I've got Art uh, motion to approve the minutes as amended. As amended. Do I have a second? I, I'll second it. John Worsham. Okay. I've got a second from John. Any further discussion? All in favor to approve the minutes, say aye. 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 Um, any opposed, say nay. Um, by the way, Ken, is it okay if I do roll call, if I do um, votes like that, unless unless I get some nays, and then if it's not unanimous one way or the other, I call roll, or do I need to call roll? I think you can vote, vote by voice, as long okay. as it's clear, clear that... I'll, I'll vote. I will do votes by voice to save time, unless um, unless the votes are not unanimous one way or the other, and then I'll do a roll call just to make sure we get it right. So there's no question. Okay. All right. First item on the agenda is subdivision 20.18, Samara. Uh, you are on board. Uh, 
Okay. Can we see the screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes. It's off now. Oh, no. I can't hear you. Okay. All right, so this is SD 20.18, a uh, two lot minor subdivision, Gafer Place. It is a public hearing to consider the request of James Scopolites for plat approval of Gafer Place subdivision, a two lot minor subdivision. The property is approximately 6.18 acres and it is located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Gafer Road Extension and Bishop Road. The applicant desires to divide the property into two lots. Can I can I ask you? She said two lot, and I've got three lot. Is it two or three? It is two lots. Yes, I'll make that change. Okay, this is our um, subject site. Then another aerial. Here's our site plan. If you remember, um, we did see this um, particular site at our last meeting. We have lot two to the front, and then lot one is the flag lot. Um, again, we saw this uh, application at our May 4th meeting. The commissioners voted to table the application. Um, the subject property is in the Fairhope's ETJ. It has been reviewed. Um, by according to the subdivision regulations the proposed subdivision does not include the building of any infrastructure at this time and it did not uh, trigger a traffic study the city of fairhope will provide water sewer and power services as well as at&t services will be provided there are currently no sidewalks along bishop road and also it should be noted that there's an existing residence, mobile home, and shed located on the proposed lot one, and a resident and two sheds on the proposed lot two. Lastly, it should be noted that the proposed lot two will have two street frontages. The subject application is not requesting a traditional lot and block subdivision as contemplated by article five section D, thus not necessarily prohibited. The applicant has requested two waivers, and um, they are one for the sidewalk. The applicants provided a letter requesting a waiver of the sidewalk along Bishop Road. In lieu of that sidewalk, they want to do a 15-foot easement for future sidewalks. And there has also been a waiver requested for fire hydrants. Um, the applicant states that the existing fire hydrant is within the 450-foot requirement. Um, the applicant also provided a letter from Fairhope Volunteer Fire Department and the letter just states that the fire engine is capable of um, having 1,200 1, feet of uh, hose. Staff is recommending denial of this application based upon nonconformance with the subdivision regulations. However, if it is the pleasure of the Planning Commission to approve this application, we have provided three possible approval scenarios, and I will go through these um, individually. The first would be acceptance of the requested fire hydrant and sidewalk waivers as requested and approval of a minor subdivision as a concurrent preliminary and final plat approval. The Planning Commission may wish to rule upon Article 5B 2E regarding health, safety, and welfare of the property, and also non-acceptance of one or more of the requested waivers and approval of case number SD 20.18 as a preliminary plat in lieu of a concurrent preliminary and final plat as typical of a minor subdivision. The applicant, the applicant will have two years to install the necessary improvements and appear before the Planning Commission for a final plat request and recording of the final plat. If case number SD.18 is approved, using the approval option number two, the applicant may wish to contact the City of Fairhope Public Works Department to determine if sidewalks may be installed by the city utilizing an aid to construction fee. 
And lastly, option number three is partial acceptance of the fire hydrant and sidewalk waivers and approval of case number SD18 as a minor subdivision with the following conditions to be noted on the plat. Sidewalks and a fire hydrant must be installed on the proposed lot two right of way at the time of any vertical construction activities and shall be a condition of receiving final occupancy approval. Sidewalks must be installed on the proposed lot one right of way at the time of any new vertical construction or class three renovation of existing structures on proposed lot one and installation of sidewalks shall be a condition of receiving final occupancy approval. A signature block for the city of Fairhope building official shall be included on the plat. And that is all that we have for the application. All right, thank you, Samara. Uh, Seth, would you like to make a presentation on behalf of the applicant? Yes, thank you. My name is Seth Moore. Moore Surveying represent Mr. Scopolese. Um, we would ask that the Planning Commission members would approve number three, the partial acceptance, uh, accepting that uh, we would ask that the um, uh, vertical construction or a class three renovation be on both lots one and two. Uh, other than that, if you all have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Uh, one, one clarification about the letter from the Fairhope Fire Department. The five inch line is what they hook up between the fire hydrant and the fire truck. So if they hook up to a fire hydrant, they can go up to 1,200 feet before they pull out the three inch, two and a half, three inch lines to actually fight the fire. Okay. Are there any questions for Seth while he's up here, commissioners? Well, Doug, uh, this is this is our I, the the question I guess for consideration would be if that is if that is case I'd have no doubt that that's the case. Then it does it does it make that uh, regulation really kind of moot in terms of why we have a regulation that says it's got to be within four hundred fifty feet? Can I can I talk to that? I'll answer some of that. I think I'm looking it up. If you read the ordinance. It doesn't say that there's nothing said about uh, plot lines in that ordinance and, and the distance from a fire hydrant. It just states that a fire hydrant, fire hydrants have to be within 450 feet of each other uh, on the street. There, so the fact that the pl the the plots are within 450 feet of a hydrant is not that relevant. The, the and then this will kick this back to the fire department, but the the fire code, which is also adopted by ordinance by the city, requires that um, the furthest part of a building on a piece of land can be no more than 400 feet from a fire hydrant, and that's at the direction of that's at the direction of the authority having jurisdiction, which in this case would be the fire chief. So that I mean the, the this this idea that the that the uh, plot is within 450 feet of a fire, I mean, of a fire hydrant is, that's not what the ordinance says. At least in my opinion. That the... Who, who is, who's this talking? Is John, this is John Worship. Okay, John, thank you. Hey, John, or Commission, this is Ken. I... In preparation for this, I also re-looked at the, at the regulation and John got it exactly right. Fire hydrants are to be at intervals of 450 feet, meaning that a lot or a residence isn't going to be any further than 225 feet from one if it's in the middle. Um, so I think John's hit it right on the head with that observation. And we've, we've dug around, this is Hunter Simmons with staff, and we've, we've been digging on this, and we didn't find any statement from Fairhope uh, Volunteer Fire Department, but we did find a letter uh, sent to the city from Barnwell, which is not in this area, but there is support from at least fire departments that makes you know people meet that anytime there's new lots created to meet that 400 feet. And so 
it may be that we need a statement from and not not how much hose they have on their their truck but what does what is the fire department stance well you know I think if we're going to start making approvals, we need to a get the fire department stance, and b we need to make sure that that's um, jives with insurance service offices requirements for the right. protection class, you know, fire rating um, in our area as well. Okay, give it, give it what just the basics. What does it require? that a fire hydrant has to be 450 feet apart from each other but as it relates to a structure or to a proximity of a lot it's got to be what okay it's not stated in our regulation or it simply says fire hydrants shall be installed along each street at a maximum interval of 450 feet or at the ends and center of each block or as otherwise required by the fire authority having jurisdiction. But the, the implication of that is that the lot would be closer than 450 feet to a fire hydrant if they were installed with that spacing. You would never be greater than 450 feet from one. I, 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 you were, who was that? And you were breaking that up was, a little That was bit. Rebecca Bryant. I didn't hear you either, Rebecca. Yeah. Say again. I, maybe my connection. I was saying that the implication of that is that no lot would be greater than 450 feet from a fire hydrant. If the spacing is followed, it would cause all lots to be closer than 450 feet to a fire hydrant. Yes, yeah. um, unless there were lots, that, unless the fire hydrants were at 450 foot intervals and there were some lots within the subdivision that went beyond the last fire hydrant you could in that situation get to a 450 foot situation but if but if there if the fire hydrants are supposed to be at intervals of 450 feet between those two fire hydrants unless it's an awfully big lot it's going to be a lot less than 450 feet between uh, from a lot and a, and a fire hydrant but whose responsibility is it then okay you've got a fire hydrant that's at point a uh 450 feet is point b but you've got uh you've got uh three let's say you've got three 10 acre parcels 10 acre lots and the width of each lot is um well hey let's say you've got two and the, the width of each lot is 660 feet so what have you got? How do you get a, whose responsibility is to put a fire hydrant to serve the second lot? Can I, uh, there, you're, the, there's an, a, a different code or exa and, and that's the, the ICC fire code, the international fire code. That requires that uh, the furthest portion of a building from a fire hydrant can be no more than 400 feet. Uh, now the the on-site fire hydrants may be required but that's at the discretion of the fire code official or the authority having jurisdiction so that 450 feet is not is not really relevant uh, i don't think because this the fire code is uh, a stricter code as far as that goes And commissioners, this is Buford King. If I can jump in very quickly, when we get to the proposed subdivision regulation amendments at the end of this meeting, we think we've got some wording that will help with that situation. Doesn't necessarily help this case, but just know that we we hear you. This is confusing. We hear you. We've got an amendment that may address it. Um, I think the condition, if it is the pleasure, like Samara said, if it's the pleasure of the commission to approve this case, we think we've given you some conditions that'll help you get past this case right now. Can I can I also add something else too? I mean, this, this, this is John. Where this also may be somewhat moot if we get to uh, SD twenty point twenty seven, uh, because that particular subdivision may take care of this. True. All right. Um, we had the public hearing at our last meeting, so. Um, 
uh, you know, if somebody from the public would like to speak, that's okay, but I was not planning on opening a public hearing again. Um, uh, I have a question for Beth. This is Rebecca Bryant. Yes, ma'am. Is that, is it too late Rebecca to speak on this issue? Okay. Uh, you know, the side of the is the other issue. And I, I thought this was, you know, it, it's the side of the lot that's only being created because we were trying to discourage the 450 people meet the 450 people meet. If we, if we need to if we denied this and then we approved it with uh, under conditions of no would the owner would the owner not to have a sign why would they would they commit to not do that to not do that? Or would it no longer be no longer be the black or white Commissioners, I'll jump in there. Thought you done everything. If the uh, uh, um, if there's um, you know if there's, there's no need for that flag lot, that flag lot, lot. If, there's, um, if there's no uh, need for that, you know that you know, the commission could make that addition of approval, and then they just simply redraw it back to its prior configuration um, in the plan that gets recorded. I don't think that would be too much of a problem. Yeah, I I believe yeah, I, if. I, I believe you all approved it. You all approved it. condition number three. Condition number three. And I don't see why they would not do that. Take that to take that to the non-flag law. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Any further discussion or questions for staff or the presenter? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, commissioners, one more thing, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Seth Moore is with you in chambers, and he mentioned he 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 very wisely pointed out a slight, a uh, very minor um, uh, uh, oversight in 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 um, in uh, option three in the conditions of approval. If you look at B, the requirement for the class three renovation, um, Seth is correct. That should be reflected on both propose lots one and two um, for both clarity and consistency sake. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I've got con I've got concerns. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, well, I, I had one other question that when John was suggesting this might get taken care of by another item on the agenda, was he proposing that we table this? I, I wasn't clear on my No, opinion. actually, I, 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 no, not necessarily. We can vote on one of these three options. I, I just, uh, it, you know, especially option three, if they take option three, it, that, it may become moot after, you know, because of the other item on the agenda, this fire hydrant thing. Mm -hmm. I think regardless of how we go on the fire hydrant, which I can certainly see both sides of, you know, I would like to make sure we've got, you know, as much clarity as possible in our in our regs. But I, I definitely think a sidewalk should be on the Bishop Road side because there's a sidewalk on the east side of Bishop Road that goes all the way to the school. And you've got, you know, on the north side of this property, you've got probably 24 units on one cul-de-sac, maybe more, um, where there's some small apartments and quadruplexes. And as that's developed, you know, I don't think we want people trespassing through their yard to get to the sidewalk going to school. So um, I'll, I'll entertain a motion of, of whatever, uh, you know, the commission brings, but I do think we should at least require sidewalks on the Bishop Road portion if we do decide to take option two or three. It, it, isn't that what option three says? Just Yes. Okay. It basically is things can stay status quo right now as as, as option three says is as, as basically any time there's construction in the future class three or vertical then they have to do that per lot so if somebody builds a new house on lot one at that point in time they have and who's gonna, sidewalk. And, and how are we going to remember that that's done? I mean, who's going to be in charge? Yeah, who's who's going to be responsible? A, who's going to be responsible for installing it? Who's going to be responsible for enforcing it? Yes, sir. Commissioners, well, if you'll notice, we're requiring a signature block on the plat for the building official. Also, part number three, those notes will be put on the plat. 
so that whoever picks it up yeah i mean i, I don't title know, wise you know, there's, a, there's a trailer on one no. side and a house on the other this may not be the, you know built on for years i just think if we subdivide it we ought to require a sidewalk on bishop road i mean we're not talking about a heck of a lot of money that's the short side anyway just a few thousand dollars i <laughs> make it safe safer for everybody out there so the owner undertaking the vertical construction or the class three renovation would be the party responsible for putting the hydrant and the sidewalk in is that what we're considering here that's the uh, uh, commissioners and ken that is the intention of the con that's the intention of the wording of the condition of approval If you call for a motion, <laughs> hey Rebe Rebecca, you, I, I am having a hard time. Do you have uh, uh, hearing you? Yes, you, you, Rebecca, you do keep breaking up. I don't, I don't think there's anything I can do about it. I dropped off the call too. I think the internet and our um, the internet in our office is is for whatever reason upstream internet is bad. Can you send smoke signals? <laughs> I try to sign. Morse code. If I can, uh, if it's possible to call in, I would be happy to do that. Actually, well, whatever you now. just, whatever you just did, sounds better. Right? Sounds now. better just now. Yeah. All right, Mr. commissioners, I'll entertain a motion. This is John Worsham. I move that we approve case SD 20.18 based on the uh, approval scenario three as developed by the staff. I've got a motion to a approve uh, the scenario three as um, listed by the staff. Do I have a second? Second. This is Art. Yeah, 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 you need to add in that one thing on Part B about both both lots, though, instead of one and two. Yeah. So, but you got that, Emily? I do. Okay. Is there any further discussion? In that case, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Um, I think if you don't mind. This, this is Richard. I'll say no on that. Okay. In that case, I'm going to do a roll call vote. Because I think Rebecca dropped off again. Okay, I'm going to do a roll call vote. Art? Yay. Rebecca? I'll come back to Rebecca. Uh, Harry? Harry, your vote? Yay. Um, John, obviously yay. Um, I was yay. Holly? Uh, your you're breaking up on me now, Lee. Yes, sir. Um, Holly? Yay. Richard, your nay? Richard Peterson? Nay. And Clarice? Yes. And Kevin? Yay. And going back to Rebecca? Uh, I'm going to have to abstain because I didn't hear the motion. The motion was to approve number... Um, number three, partial acceptance of fire hydrant and sidewalk waivers approval of case SD 2018. The item, the third there. Uh, without, without amending that so that they have to do a sidewalk now? That is correct. Okay, I think I vote nay. Okay, and that's a nay. So that's uh, two nays and the rest yays. All right, thank you, Rebecca. All right, next item on the agenda is the Laurel Brook subdivision, uh, village subdivision request, SD 2024. And that will be uh, presented Carla. by Carla Davis. Thank you, Carla. You're welcome. Uh, I am here to present to you case 20.24, Laurel Brook subdivision. This is 176 lot village subdivision. Here we have an aerial image to your left with the subject site identified and a zoning map image to your right 
But the subjects are identified, also indicating the airport. And it should also be noted that there's an existing concrete business to the south of the subject site and a dark pit operation to the east of the subject site. And then again, farm land to the north and west of Highway 181. The property is located on the east side of State Highway 181, approximately a half a mile north of County Road 24, and is within the city of ECJ. The applicant is proposing a 176 single family lot on 59.72 acres, with one main entrance along Highway 181 and a 30 foot ingress egress easement to serve as an emergency vehicle only road. And that would also be accessed via Highway 181. The plat depicts the lots as being 60 feet in width and 140 feet in length. However, there are some lots that may range between 140 feet and 145 feet in depth. There are three proposed phases. The initial phase one is planned to start construction in January of 2021. Phase of construction is scheduled for June 2022. And phase three is anticipated to start approximately January of 2024, with all of the above date subject to the change dependent upon the market. Here we have the actual preliminary plat that they submitted. There again, the plat would depict 176 lots and has five declared common areas slash green space. The smallest lot is 8,400 square feet with majority of the other lots in similar size. The proposed setbacks for the lots are 20 feet on the front and rear yard and they'll be 10 feet on the side and 15 on the side street. Article 5 section E5A requires a 15 foot drainage and utility easement on the side and rear lot lines which may lie equally on either side of the adjacent lot. The are not depicted on the plat, however, will be required for final plat approval if approved. Dwelling units as proposed will range from 1,652 square feet and 2,058 square feet. The common areas represent 12.76 acres, with 10 acres of the site being designated as green space, which includes a lake. A density study was conducted by staff, which determined the actual development density for the surrounding neighborhood is 1.47 units per acre. The requested density from the applicant is 2.95 nits per acre to allow the 176 units on the 59.72 acres. Based upon the 15,000 square foot lots, the same development with similar size right away in common areas would contain approximately 100 lots or 1.67 units per acre, roughly rounded to 1.75 units per acre. The subdivision regulations state that unzoned areas require a minimum lot size of 15,000 square feet and a minimum lot width of 100 feet. However, this plat proposes lots as small as 8,400 square feet and a width of 60 by 140 lots. Based on the current requirements, 100 lots would be able to be constructed within the development and would still meet the density requirements, as opposed to the 176 proposed lots that exceed the density requirements for the development with this amount of acreage. The plat also depicts, again, the several common areas, the lake, a pool, and cabana that would be located at the south end overlooking the lake. The applicant provided a narrative that also stated that there will be a pocket park on the eastern side of the development. It should be pointed out that a tree survey is required but has not yet been submitted. The elevations of the amenities, the pool house and cabana, have not been submitted but can be submitted at a later date. If the, is a, the development will be served by the City of Fairhope for water services, Baldwin County Sewer, Bowen AMC for electrical service and AT&T for phone service. The village subdivision regulations are intended to provide an alternative to the standard subdivision regulations, as well as encourage imaginative design, planning and environmentally sensitive based on a comprehensive site specific plan. As presented, the plan does not appear to depict 
of imaginative design in order to display innovative design standards with the current layout of the site. As proposed, the plat greatly exceeds the density for this area. Furthermore, the current plat does not depict a vast range of lot sizes. Therefore, staff recommends denial of case SD 20.24 Laurel Brook Village Subdivision due to the fact it creates a high density development that is not appropriate in the area that is essentially undeveloped. However, staff does not object to tabling the request to a future meeting to allow revisions by the applicant, if that is indeed the commission's desire. That is all that I have for this case. If there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Or well, thank you very much, Carla. Are there any questions for staff at this time? In that case, I will go ahead and allow the um, owner or representative to speak at this time. I don't see an engineer listed here, but the name of the applicant is 68V Pay Dirt LLC. Um, is there anybody who wishes to speak? Steve Humphreys with Dewberry is Steve. Okay. If he's on the call with us. All right, Thank Steve, you. are you here? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Good. All right. I, uh, Carla did a good job of presenting all the detailed information about what we're proposing. We certainly understand uh, the density issue from the standpoint of how the city has calculated density in the past. We, uh, in working with the developers who have really been trying to come up with, as you would guess, more of a market need here and in hopes of being able to go through the village subdivision process to to get a better density than what is allowed by your typical uh, 15,000 square foot, 100 foot wide lots. Um, I've certainly been a part of other village subdivisions where we've accomplished that in your ETJ. Um, and I guess where we're at here is more of a, uh, you, you know, just what is acceptable. And, and I guess it becomes a, a judgment call and, and we were hoping that we were providing to you some um, a, a project that in itself with with the lake the amenity areas the open areas we put in with the trails that we're putting in we felt like we were creating a community here that uh, would be a viable community that that uh, makes for a nice neighborhood it it meets uh, the county regulations which you know being in the etj we certainly have to meet their regulations also it meets all of the county regulations um, so we don't feel like that some of the density calculations that are typically applied in the city would apply here. This is a, a, a little bit different situation. It's even outside of your comprehensive uh, plan. Your comprehensive plan stops up at County Road 32. This is beyond that. Uh, so, you know, we feel like we're somewhat in a gray area, so we were ho just hoping that you folks would consider a project uh, of this type in, in this particular area. That, uh, and, and I do have, I, I know that our client has uh, one of their representatives that also is online that may want to speak to this. So I will defer to him if he wants to add comments, but I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Steve. Um, Anybody else on behalf of the client wish to add anything at this time? Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joe Everson. <clears throat> I'm uh, here on behalf of the developer, which is 68 Ventures. So um, we've been working on this project for several months now and fully understand, you know, uh, y'all's the density requirements and fully understand, you know, you know, the comprehensive plan and, and the concern of putting a project like this a little bit south on 181. Uh, but we really, uh, you know, we feel like we're developing a subdivision that offers several favorable characteristics to the residents. And uh, we think that it, a few of these characteristics line up with your village concept designation. Um, number one, we think we are uh, encouraging physical activity among the residents and that's being done by nearly three and a half miles of a combination of lakefront walking trails as well as sidewalks. Um, we also feel like this is a community or a neighborhood that will promote a sense of community 
uh, through a first class amenities package, which includes a lakeside pool, the uh, aforementioned walking trails, and then also more than 10 acres of combined green space for the residents. Um, we did, I thought we had submitted uh, full scale renderings of all the amenities, the lakefront, uh, pool area and cabana, uh, as well as all the walking trails, but we can definitely get that to you guys at a later date uh, if you have it. Um, and then the final thing is this project, uh, we've selected Trulin Homes. Uh, you guys are familiar with Trulin Homes, they're a reputable local builder. Um, we fully expect that the end product of this uh, community will include high quality, all brick housing. And we believe that the size, pricing, and location uh, it's rise to meet the heart of the demand for new single family housing in this market. So, you know, that being said, I'll turn it over to, you know, the guys that are a lot smarter than me um, for any, you know, technical questions. But definitely, uh, we've put a lot of thought into this and just this is more of a an attempt to, to reach out and, and get the, you know, the demand for housing, for new housing in this market. Um, and so, you know, that being said, we'll definitely answer any questions you guys have. Thank you very much. Um, I'll go ahead and at this time, I'll open the public hearing to see if anybody wishes to speak in our packets. We did have uh, one letter from Danny Calhoun representing the, um, representing the Creekwood uh, LLC um, opposed to that density in that location. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, since the packets were put together, we did receive two additional letters of support from adjacent property owners. Of support? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, is there anybody in the public wish to come in at this time? And uh, Would anybody uh, wish to come in at this time and speak to this item? If so, um, now, is, now is your opportunity. I'll go ahead and pause a few moments, and if you wish to speak, if you're in the public and wish to speak for or against this item, uh, please state your name and your address, please. And, and Joe, what's the code if they're on the phone? We've got two people called call in the phone. Star six. I think it's star six eight. Star six. If you do want to speak and you're calling in from a phone, if you'll hit star six to mute, un mute and unmute yourself. All right. Uh, last chance, Laurel Brook subdivision out on Highway 181, uh, probably about a mile, mile and a half, maybe two miles south of uh, County Road 32 on the east side. Anybody wish to speak to this item? Uh, if not, I will go ahead and close the public hearing at this time and turn the meeting over to the commissioners. Commissioners, do you have any questions for staff or for um, S Steve Pumphrey or Joe Everson? Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I just make a general comment before the commissioners deliberate? Yes, sir. And so, the commissioners, we don't see village subdivisions very often. Um, there, the last time we had a village subdivision requested was two years ago, and um, and it never made it before the. It was heard once by the planning commission, but never made it back to the planning commission for approval. So this is a bit of a rare occurrence. Think of this similar to a PUD only it's contained completely within the subdivision regulations. So if the village subdivision is approved, the normal subdivision process must still occur behind this. So just keep that in mind as you contemplate this item. And thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Buford. There's some things I like about this. I do like the lake and the walking trails. Um, you know, my, my concerns with it is it is a lot of density out a good ways out and the one ingress and egress out there um, is a concern to me as well. Um, it's just, it, it, it just seems like a lot of density, you know, that far out to me. 
uh, Lee, this is this is art. I've uh, you know I've been of the opinion that a village subdivision is very uh, in in not very similar, but in one regard it is to a uh, PUD, and that is that it should have some unique aspect to it, to where it it envisions a unique development opportunity in order in 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 order to have the density that goes along with it. I, I see absolutely nothing unique to this. I think the I think you're right in, in, in one thing that you did say. 176 units and one one uh, ingress and egress just doesn't sound like uh, what needs to happen. That there's no telling what's going to happen on 181 coming up in the future and the possibility that that our dot will be that far down four lane at any time and, and probably our lifetimes be slim and none. But one ingress and egress just doesn't seem appropriate appropriate. And the size of the lots, it just seems to me that it's pushing the envelope to try to use the village subdivision uh, uh, program to accommodate a higher density. And I'm, I, I just don't think that's, that's uh, I, I just don't see it in this. Nothing unique about this subdivision, in my opinion. So, unless somebody else has got something, I'd make a motion. Okay. Th thank you, Art. Anybody else have anything to add? Nobody. If not, I'll accept a motion. All right. Uh, this is Art. Case SD 20.24 Laurel Brook subdivision. Uh, village subdivision, I move that uh, we deny uh, the subdivision request uh, because of the density as, uh, as it is contemplated within our subdivision regulations and uh, also the, the, uh, the issue associated with only one ingress and egress. So I move that we deny it. I've got a motion to deny. Do I have a second? This second. is Harry Kohler. I have a second that. I have a second from Harry Kohler. Um, is there any further discussion? Hello. Hello, what happened? Yeah. I Hello. Can Somebody's you All right. Um, I, I have a motion to deny um, SD 2024 from Art Dias and a second from Harry Kohler. Is there any further discussion? If we're not speaking, please hit mute at this time. Any further discussion at this time? If not, um, I'm going to go ahead and do a roll call on this, so get ready, please. I'm going to start at the uh, at my right all the way and work to the left. Um, Art Dias. Okay, so a motion, I mean a, a vote of yay means to that deny. you're approving the denial. Yes, if you vote yay, you are you're approving the denial. You're not the approving denial. the denial, meaning that you're you're accepting the motion for denial. You are accepting the motion for right. denial. A, a yay okay. is a denial vote, correct? All right, yay. Rebecca? She got kicked off, but she's trying to get back on. Okay, I'll come back to Rebecca. Harry? Yay. John? Yay. Yay for myself, Holly. Holly Holly McKellar. Hey Holly, if you can take it off of mute and let us know what your vote is. All right, I'll come back to Holly and Rebecca. Uh, Richard? Aye. And Clarice? Yay. Kevin? Yay. <clears throat> And Rebecca, are you back on? She texted me. She votes to deny. She's watching it, and she can't get back on. Okay, let me. It's um, Holly votes yay. Okay, I've well, got a text this, from Holly this, that she I know votes. This sounds yay. hyper technical, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. But, you know we're operating in different times and under the governor's proclamation that allows this meeting mm -hmm. we need it's not going to change the vote but the two ladies i mean tech texting in your vote is not 
we have to be able to hear them or see them. Okay. Let me. Well, you know, Ken, I can't see you because you're in the shadows. <laughs> Holly, no, Holly not, is hey, on. Hey, hey, just on. Muted. Yeah, can you not? She can, can you not unmute. call in? I am. I'm on. I'm on, and I'm. Uh, you're on mute. And, no, my mute is not on. I'm we got you loud and clear now, Holly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> can you all hear Holly? We can hear. Okay, so Holly votes yay. All right, and finally Rebecca. Um, uh, you, I vote to deny. That's yay, right? Okay, yes, that is. All right. Okay, yeah. Votes goes unanimously. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Uh, next item on the agenda is the Mars Hill subdivision. Uh, Buford, you are on, sir. Okay, good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you, everyone. And commissioners, if you can give me just a moment to share my screen. If y'all can indulge me just a second, I won't explain what froze up on my end. Just to give, just a, a, I'll assure you that I'll be with you in just a second for Mars Hill. And so, as I'm opening this up, commissioners, this is a three-lot minor subdivision, and I will have slides for you. Okay, everyone, can you see my slide? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Okay, commissioners. So, uh, have a uh, first of all, we'll start off with the zoning map. The subject property you'll see there marked in the center is unzoned in Baldwin County. Uh, this is at the northeast intersection. Uh, the northeast quadrant of the intersection of County Road 32 and Green O Road. Um, you'll see the nearest property within the city of Fairhope is actually the northern, the northern stretches of the uh, of the Sunny Callahan Airport. Here is an aerial image of the site. You will see that the site slightly irregular shaped and is outlined in red with the call outs as we've described previously. Commissioners, this is the slide before you here gives you the background information. You see the three lot sizes requested in unzoned Baldwin County in their planning district 17, as we discussed. Um, the applicant, the owner and the applicant is CFP Housing, um, and the name submitted was Mr. Curtis Pilot. The uh, staff recommendation is denial. And similar to what you saw earlier, commissioners, we do have some. We do have some prepared some conditions of approval that we'll have ready if the planning commission does wish to uh, approve this uh, minor subdivision. Uh, commissioners, I won't read word for word everything off your screen here. This is summarizing what is in your packet. I think the biggest issue with this minor subdivision, commissioners, is that it's proposing uh, it's proposing um, a private right of way called Mars Hill Lane. And the issue we found that staff has is that that lane meets neither a standard as a lot or a standard as a right of way. And we didn't have any information indicating if that existing driveway on that, the proposed Mars Hill Lane is existing the Mars Hill Church building. Um, you'll see the plat here in just a second. We don't have any information knowing if that driveway was designed and installed to any kind of public right of way standard that would allow it to be dedicated to the city or the county. Um, it's possible that it could be improved to a public standard, but we'd need a more robust development application to explain uh, that information. And, and commissioners, I think what our fear here is that um, if that private right of way was allowed to be created, it would create, it's likely or possible there might be some redevelopment of this site in the future. And so we would just have a cascading effect of nonconformity with waivers, nonconformity with waivers. Um, so that's our fear for approving it as is. Um, we did receive uh, a request for, for waivers, which we'll explain here in just a moment. Um, so what we'll do, commissioners, I think the best way to summarize it is just to go straight to the staff recommendation. And commissioners pausing just a second because we have a little bit of background noise. Um, so the staff recommendation is denial and for the following reason. As we mentioned, the uh, the uh, uh, Mars Hill, first of all, 
Um, proposed lot one does not front upon a paved publicly maintained street and that a, wa a waiver has been requested from that requirement and you see the article in section referencing that. And we, as we mentioned, Mars Hill Lane fails to comply with the lot standards or the street requirements, which we talked about earlier. And also sidewalks are not contemplated by the application. Um, staff does not necessarily object to a request for a partial sidewalk waiver because um, uh, the right of ways for this property are more than one road mile than the nearest sidewalk pedestrian uh, and, a, and a pedestrian sidewalk easement could be placed on the plat, but the waiver is requesting requirement from all sidewalk requirements. And so, so therefore, what you have before you on this slide, commissioners, is the basis for recommendation of denial. Um, if it is the pleasure of the Planning Commission to go ahead and approve it, we have uh, three conditions of approval before you right here. And just to summarize them uh, very briefly, um, if it is the pleasure of the Commission to go ahead and approve it, what we would request at the staff level is make it a preliminary plat approval uh, in lieu of the normal concurrent preliminary final plat you get on a typical minor subdivision. And what that would do is it would allow um, it would allow the necessary improvements to Mars Hill Lane to attain a public right-of-way standard to allow those improvements to be done. Um, and then if the if it was the pleasure of the Planning Commission to go ahead and require sidewalks on Greeno Road and County Road 32, it would allow a two, it would allow the typical two-year time period to allow those to be installed. Um, also, two and three are kind of a housekeeping item, but it would require prepare it require preparing a stormwater operations and maintenance plan and agreement because there is an existing stormwater system on the property and and, um, and commissioners I don't think we have a health safety or welfare issue on here we've got commission we've got uh, condition of approval three as a placeholder for that um, the uh, the site has several fire hydrants on site right now to provide fire protection to that entire site. So I don't believe there is a health, safety, and wealth, welfare issue here. I just wanted to include it as a condition of approval to make certain we illuminate that for the Planning Commission. So, commissioners, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions by, uh, on behalf of staff. And I can go back to the recommendation to denial to clarify that if we need to. Thank you, Buford. Um, is uh well, does anybody have any questions for staff at this time go, go buford go back to your um go back to your recommendations for denial please okay yes sir you should uh, have all it. right uh what does it take it, it can is, is mars hill you say it's a private right of way is you now you're calling it a right of way it's not an easement there's the difference as, as we probably all know a right of way is where you own the dirt underneath the, the right to use that property an easement is uh, uh, a right to use the surface but you don't actually own the dirt underneath that that easement so is it a right of way or is it an easement and and commissioners that's a fantastic question and that was something we clarified in the review process and, and mr. Pumphrey can can correct me if I mistake this but um, uh, as we understand and as we were as we were in, informed during the review process is that the request is to create and plat a, a private right-of-way so it would be a right-of-way and therefore and and that's fine and we do the we do see these from time to time especially in PUDs but we have to know that it was designed and built to a public standard or we have drawings that show it was designed it will be built to a public standard and unfortunately we just don't have that information uh, on this case as it stands right now what is Mars Hill Lane is it an easement or is it a right-of-way no, sir. Currently, in its current form, you be, in its current form, you have a you have a piece of property. You have a piece of property with a driveway on it. Is basically its current form. That property fronts upon Greeno Road, and so the church building is accessed by direct contact with the right of way. And that is just it, that is in its current form a driveway. Yeah, I, I don't um, like I don't like that at all, Buford, and I can't believe that a developer would present that to us. I've got a situation right now with a friend of mine about two miles further south than this where they had that same similar situation. 
he bought a lot, the person behind him bought a lot, and then the man passed away who owned the remainder lot, and a lady in Spanish Fort bought the remainder lot for taxes, and now they've got some kind of a legal issue deciding how they get into the rear of his property or the front of the other property. And I, but anyway, they, they've chosen to present it, and I don't see where it's your job to give five options of us to approve it if they can't present it properly. This thing, to me, is a little bit insulting, to be honest, Buford, um, that it's brought to us like this. When I've got no problem with what they're looking to do, everything that the pilots have done has been extremely attractive that I've seen, and I'm sure the end product will be great, but I just don't see where this is the way to get there. Well, I, mean, I, agree, I, I agree with I agree with Lee. Uh, I, I, as I've I've already mentioned, I've got a. There are a lot of questions associated with what you call Mars Hill Lane private. Well, do the if the pilots own the rest of this property, do they own the property under which the the church is uh, built, or or do, or do they own the property under Mars Hill Lane? And do they if they don't, then how do they have anyone have the right to take that that lane and and make it into a into a uh, a street that conforms to the rules and the regulations of uh, of either the county or the or the city's uh, uh, road requirements I, I don't I don't get it there's yeah. too many questions to be answered it seems to me and just for that one thing. And commissioners, this is Buford. One more, one more quick statement here, and I'll I'll be quiet. I promise. Um, and, and without naming names or anything like that, but there's a, there's a there's another PUD in there's a PUD in Fairhope right now being developed. And when the plats were approved, it showed a a strip of land sh uh, uh, shown on the plat reserved uh, for future right of way. But the difference was is that during the approval process, we had we had drawings. Um, engineer stamp drawings that showed the asphalt thickness, the sand clay base underneath the asphalt, the compacted subgrade underneath all of that. We knew it was designed to a public standard, so therefore it could be dedicated to the city or the county at a future time. And so, um, and that's not to say that this case right here couldn't attain that. We just don't have the information to support that right now. And to add on to that, the if, within the PUD. The city can require uh, covenants for who's maintaining that road, even if it uh, remains a private road, but there's multiple people there with something at stake. Somebody's responsible for that, which we don't have the mechanism. At least this, is, this is unzoned county, so they can't apply for a PUD. It is adjacent to the city, but they don't have that instrument for this. Right. Well, and also, uh, on top of it, if you look, just take lot three as an example. You've got uh, a private road that runs all the way along the south line of, of, of lot three, but in the back of lot three, how the devil are you going to get from back there when it's maybe subdivided out to the highway? If that Mars Hill Lane is a private road, they don't have, they don't have access to it. Anyway, I, I think it's, it doesn't seem to be enough sugar for a dime here. All right, let me go, let me go ahead and let's move forward. Um, would would someone like to uh, make a present? I'm going to ask for uh, Dewberry first, and then I'll open the public hearing. Um, Stephen, is this you on for Dewberry also? Yeah. Do you have anything you want to add to uh, that? Well, sure I do. You guys have already made your mind up, but let me go ahead and tell you the story on this. What we're trying to do this site. It, it, uh, most, I'm sure everybody knows that this was Faith Baptist Church at one time. Uh, they had a major master plan for this site, uh, but they never developed it all out. They built the church. They built the roadway and the associated parking that goes along uh, for that. Uh, so now they don't need, they don't intend uh, to develop the site out as originally planned, so it became... A question of could we carve the church site out with a roadway created, a right of way created on the existing roadway to get access to lot one. Being that we're in the ETJ, we contacted the county and they told us immediately that we could not do a public road because of the parking 
along each side of the existing road. We could put a right of way. They were fine with it being a private right of way. Uh, and, and due to that, I can't, to me, the things that Buford has put in his conditions of approval, uh, I can't, there's no need to ever do that because I can't get to a public road. It would always be a private road as far as the county is concerned, um, unless, unless, you know, some point in the future it ever gets annexed into the city. But uh, at this point, we're stuck with having to do a private road because we're still in the county. And so that's what we were kind of bound to. And, and uh, so, you know, that's, that's the, there's no intent at this point. We, we were asked what was our proposed use. We have put commercial. Uh, we don't have uh, interested parties at this point on lot three or lot two. Uh, but the goal was to get the church site carved out, get access to it. it. Has to be a private road, so that was that's what we were that's what we're left with. So we were hoping that this was not going to be near the issue that it sounds like that it is. Uh, Steve, this is Art. Let me let me add, go back to this because I still am, am am not clear on it. You said the county said you could not have a public road. Mars Hill Lane could not be a public road. Is it a right of way right now, or is it an easement? It's neither, Art. There is nothing there but a road, just a, a physical road there. We, the owners, would like to put a right of way across that existing pavement, and we would have been glad to call it a public road. It's just the county says because there are parking spaces on existing parking spaces along that existing roadway, which would be within the right-of-way that we're creating, they will not allow it to be a public road because they don't want parking spaces in their right-of-way. Yeah, but there's a long way between having a public road and having a lot that has no right-of-way and, and the people who the other lots created have no legal access to them. And that's how it's being presented to us right now is there's no legal access to, uh, well, everybody has legal access through the private roadway. Lots one, two, and three would all front on that private roadway. They would all share in the maintenance of that private road. What if lot three was divided into five lots? They all have access to Mars Hill Lane? Only with your approval. If, if the county says you can't have, you've got to have a private, that's got to be a private right of way. And, and, but you come to the city in the ETJ for subdivision approval, which is what this is. What am I missing here? Why, why is uh, the, the roadway not uh, have to conform to city specifications? Well, I can't meet both. So I guess, you know, at that yeah. art, I you would tell me I'd be denied just because I can't meet your regulate, but I can't, I can't change the county side. The county's told me flat out I can't have a public right of way. So, uh, I mean, I, I've been in this business a long time. We do private. I've seen private roads all over the place. Now, I don't, it's not like that's something unusual. So, I'm not sure what I under, what I'm hearing you all say about the problem with the private road. Well, it. It, it looked to me, it looks to me like the private road, well, I was under the impression the private road for the benefit of Lot 1. Is that not right? Well, it's got, yeah, Lot 1 has to have access to it, and whether it's public or private, it's still a legal access. It'd just be a private right-of-way. That just means the, count, the city nor the county will be maintaining that road. Lots 1, 2, and 3 will be maintaining it. And no matter what happens in with lots one, two, and well, let's take lot one out. Two and three, whoever, whatever they do with lots two or three, can still access Mars Lane. Oh lots. yes, most definitely. As a practical matter, Art, that's the only way future buyers of lot three are going to get out. There's a drainage. 
there's a detention pond and some looks like a low spot with some drainage in it between the bulk of lot three and Greeno Road. They're not going to go across that. Even if they could, Aldot's not going to give them a turnout permit that close to the existing driveway. No, that's right. So basically, what we're talking about here is allowing a subdivision of a sizable piece of property on a private road, which we which is not consistent with the subdivision regulations. Yeah, that's the way I see it. Can I, can I, this is John Worsham. Can I just ask a question? If the issue is having parking on that road, can't you eliminate that parking? I could only ask the, de the developer, the owners, if that's what they'd want to do. That'd be expensive, but to an answer your question, yes, that could be done. It just had a cost, of course. What would be expensive about eliminating parking on the road? Well, it's just the cost of, of removing it and then then coming back and finishing it off with the Hollywood curbing. I think there's curbing around it and drainage involved, so it's it's some of that will have to be reworked in order to do that. There's there are storm drains in place up and down this road. There's a ex very extensive <coughs> drainage system for this site that was plan for a total development here but uh, like I said it never was fully developed I, I really feel that if you worked with Buford that y'all could come up with a solution where you'd have a recommendation to approve at our next meeting uh, commissioners and chairman if I can interject real quick um, and of course this is um, uh, staff does not object to tabling the item to a future meeting um, that way, that way, the commission could hear, you know, could hear the details, hear the details of of of, um, of any amendments that the applicant wishes to make to the application. Um, that's why that's why we structured a condition of approval if the planning commission wanted to go ahead and act to treat it as a preliminary plat, because that would allow the applicant the the customary two years to make whatever improvements are needed. So um, and. Um, and if it's better to do that tonight, that's fine. If it's better to table it and revisit this at a future meeting, that's also fine. Um, but that would allow those improvements to be made if we did it as a preliminary plat, come back for a final plat after the improvements are done. Steve, um, I would get just along those same lines of what Beaver's uh, uh, stating there, and based on what Ken just said, that if I don't see how we could approve a road that does not and a subdivision that does not meet the subdivision requirements of the city of Faro. So with that said, then do you want to, do you want do you want to uh, uh, I'm Steve, maybe our, I'm, next, I'm with, our next meeting's more than 30 days away so we don't have the ability to table this. I can either Open we the public take, hearing and we, we can, can go take forward. With, with the <coughs> developers or the developers' representatives express consent because it would take 30 days right, to get that, to the next yeah, meeting. Yeah, that, that's what I was getting to. Can I say we can't, you know, on our own, we can't table it, but you can request that we do if you want to, Stephen. Otherwise, I can open the public hearing and keep moving forward. It's up to you. If the Planning Commission would consider that then I would like to request that it be tabled and, um, and 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 I represent the developer in that so I would I would make that request if you'd be willing to give it absolutely I, I mean I overall the plan I think it's going to be fine I don't I think y'all can find a pretty easy solution on it um, is somebody yeah, willing to make a with, motion that we'll we out with staff and see what we can come up with is there somebody willing to make a motion to table I might make that motion and do I have a second John Worsham second. second. Okay. We'll um, put the second down for John and the motion with Art. Um, under further discussion, i just like to mention that the developer did uh, say it was okay for the tabling. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Is there any opposed say nay? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Steve. All right. Next object on the agenda is uh, SD 2026 public hearing to consider the request of Robert Roberts Brothers LLC for plat approval of the Roberts Brothers subdivision a two lot minor subdivision and Buford it is you once again that's 
right, uh, commissioners. And uh, if you can indulge me a moment to get my slides, to share my slides where you can see. Okay, commissioners, are you seeing? Are you seeing slides? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, commissioners, here we go. Uh, so, commissioners, this is um, a minor, a two-lot minor subdivision request, and we'll we'll get to the details here in just a second. Um, if you, this is a case. This is a this is a minor subdivision following an MOP case that the Planning Commission approved about a year ago. So if you'll notice in your zoning map, uh, the property is unzoned, but it's adjacent to Hollowbrook. Um, you'll see that it is on the west side of Highway 181, just south of State Highway 104. You also see the, uh, the aerial image right there with it shown in crosshatch. And uh, Mr. Larry Smith will, will, will join us, <coughs> David Deal, also is actually uh, um, handling the minor subdivision and Larry was the engineer of record on the MOP and I'll explain how all of that works together here in just a moment you see the size of the property um, the size of the two lots that are proposed um, and the location and uh, uh, Mr. Roberts is the uh, is the uh, uh, applicant and we're recommending approval and so commissioners as we mentioned uh, mentioned earlier so case number SD 19.16 was an MOP that was approved April 1 of last year. And so there's a, there's a Scrivener's error in your, in your staff report. I'll get to that in a minute. For this to make sense, that MOP from about a year ago approved nine units. Um, so you have five units in the building in the center, three units in the building that is nearest to the right-of-way, and then a single unit in another building that will be constructed on the far west end of the property. So keep that nine units in your mind. This is the actual plat for the site. And so lot one and lot two. Um, so we're having, we're taking a site that contains an existing MOP approval, preserving that MOP, but just simply creating lots. Um, we have this lot does not front upon Highway 181 if it is created. So it's, it's accessed via a common access easement as you see right there. Also the drainage from this lot will be handled by lot one and the drainage has already been designed as all that was accomplished in the MOP. So the idea is to freeze the MOP, leave it in place, but create two lots. A lot of the background information, commissioners, was again handled by the MOP. All the utility providers are noted. There are some things, that, there's quite a few conditions of approval on this one as you'll see, but that's simply to memorialize the MOP and also to reflect actually we've satisfied conditions of the MOP. Um, as you see here, the drainage system was designed properly during the MOP case. That is not changing. Uh, the traffic study was not required on the MOP case. That's the same here. So we'll get right to the uh, recommendation of approval, commissioners. Um, so we recommend approval, and there are several conditions. I'll just go through them here because they're helping to basically preserve the MOP case. Um, first of all, prior approval of the MOP is preserved and memorialized here. And we're just reflecting here that lot one is limited to eight units, which we saw earlier. Lot two is limited to one unit. The addition of any new units will require a new MOP application. In your staff report, in your staff report, I misworded this. What you see in red is correct, and we asked the Planning Commission to consider that. We also memorialized condition of approval number one will be satisfied. Um, there is a brand new 12-inch water main that is not yet functioning. And we need a fire flow from that 12-inch water main for file purposes when that 12-inch water main is, uh, is placed into service. Um, that will be more than substantial to provide all the water flow and pressure for this site. Um, they're also installing, and Mr. Smith let me uh, uh, advise me earlier today, they will have a, they will install, they will install a, a fire hydrant on the site in the middle of the site to protect both buildings. Uh, as you see right there, a private fire hydrant. So we just memorialize here that that safety welfare, health safety and welfare condition has been satisfied by placing that. Again, that was a function of the MOP. Uh, again, 
we're memorializing that the stormwater and a uh, stormwater O and M plan and agreement is needed. Um, once the once they have a recorded plat for the subdivision and to furnish us the instrument number of that document, um, as you see item here, we're going to memorialize condition of approval number five has been has been fulfilled. So the the green space the green space required for the MOP is still preserved. And you'll notice some is reflected on lot two, some is reflected on lot one. So the 0.2 acres required is satisfied. Not only is it satisfied for the whole site, it's satisfied for each lot. So that has been preserved. Um, condition of approval five. This is asking the planning commission to uh, consider a waiver that lot two does not front upon a paved publicly maintained road. It is accessed via the common access easement we saw earlier. This is, um, this, is, this is, I've added this red text that was not in your staff report. Uh, this is a fully engineered site. We have a developed engineered site plan. So I as a staff member don't object to having that, that lot in that configuration because of this. Um, if there was a desire to change this site in some way, it would basically require redeveloping the whole site. I don't think you can resubdivide anything else. Um, at the MOP case, as you see in item number six, um, there was no requirement at that time for sidewalks um, when this MOP was approved. And noting here, the nearest sidewalk along Highway 101 is greater than one road mile than the subject property. And then seven is just to reflect any notes on the plat that might be required by Baldwin County. Um, this may, this is a bit more of an intense development because of the approved MOP. Uh, so commissioners, that is all I have. Uh, this is a little bit complicated, so I'm happy to answer any questions the, on behalf the, of staff. The building's already built out, correct? So, uh, commissioners, the, this Ms. building. This Larry Smith. Um, yeah, thanks, Larry. <laughs> Uh, this is Larry. Um, one of the buildings, the middle building is built. Um, there was one existing building that is obviously still there. And then the third building, the pad has been um, prepped and we're just waiting for this approval to proceed with that um, building. Thank you, Larry. And also, while, while I've got you, um, I, it's my understanding from talking with Jay that the 12 inch main is live. Um, he just didn't want us flowing any hydrants right now until the watering um, restrictions are eased. Um, that was that was the only um, issue. But the fire hydrant is installed and we're just waiting for them to get back with us and tell us when we can start flowing hydrants again because we've got a couple of them to do. All right. Do you have anything else to add besides that, Larry? Because I'm going to open the public hearing here in just a moment. Uh, I do not. Okay. Well, if you'll stay close by in case any questions come up. Um, Buford, do you have anything else? Or, or if not, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing and get that No, done. sir. Thank you, Chairman. Thank um, you, Buford. Um, thanks for your presentation. Yeah, um, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing at this time. Does anybody wish to speak to this item? This is a uh, two-lot, excuse me, a, um, yes, a two-lot subdivision on Highway 181, just south of Hollowbrook on the uh, west side of 181. If you wish to speak to this item, uh, you can hit unmute at this point. I'll give you a few moments. And by the way, um, Emily has not had anybody sign up to speak to this or any other item today. Um, all right, at this case, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing at this point and turn the meeting over to the commissioners. Commissioners, do I have any Further questions for Larry or for Buford? If not, I will entertain a motion. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Richard, I have a hard time seeing what the difference between this one is and the one we just had to table. Well, this one has a actual easement written for the people to access both lots, where the other one does not. And the other one had a separate lot set that was purely uh, a road lot. Well, that sounds like semantics to me. I, I think you should have legal access to your lot, and I think clearly here lot two has legal access to it. In the other case, I don't think we had clear legal access to the lot. Besides, this one meets the subdivision regs, the last one did not. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, uh, and that's a fantastic question. 
that, that's a that's an excellent question, and I think the difference here is that um, we have a we have a, went through went through a very detailed multiple occupancy project process where we have an engineered in progress developed site where we know we know exactly what this site is doing where it is we know the drainage has been designed we know that we'll get an O&M plan and agreement on the drainage system and that um, that 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 future resubdivisions is very unlikely unless the entire property is redeveloped so I think that is where this one rises to the level that staff that, that I, as a staff member, could recommend it. And, and we did not, and also it should be noted, we did not deny the last one. The last one we uh, we carried over to the next meeting, so the last item has not been uh, denied either. I, I understand all that. I, I'm wondering about the access easement. Is it just on half of the existing driveway, or is it going to take up the whole driveway? Do you have that answer, Larry? This is uh, um, David Deal. Uh, this is David Deal with SC Civil. Um, the access easement covers the travel lanes of the gravel driveway. Thank you, David. Any more questions from commissioners? If not, I'll entertain a motion. John Worsham. I, I, I move that we approve case SD 20.26 with staff recommendations. I've got a motion to approve 20.26 with staff recommendations. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca seconded, and um, the motion was made by John. Any further discussion? And since we've been having trouble with people coming in, I think I feel more comfortable if we roll call the vote. So, um, you get ready. I'm going to go from right to left again. Um, the motion is to approve the subdivision 20.26 as per staff recommendation. Um, Art, yay yeah, or nay? Yes. Yeah. Rebecca? Rebecca? All right, I'll come, I'll come back to Rebecca. Uh, Holly, uh, Harry? Aye. John? Aye. Aye for me, Holly? Holly, are you there? Thumbs up. Okay, Richard? <laughs> I, I'm going to say no until we approve the other one, then I'll make it. I don't think moment, you can uh, say no until we approve the other one. You're you're the, yeah, you're not. I'm sorry? <laughs> Well, I'm gonna vote no today then. That's fine. Okay. Clarice. Yes. And Kevin. Yeah. And does Richard? Does that mean you're gonna vote no on the other as well if they have the same? No, I said I'd change this vote when we pass the other one. Can you try Rebecca. Again? Uh, Rebecca. She's trying to get back. I vote to approve. Okay. And finally, Holly. She gave a thumbs up. Is that, does a thumbs up count for you, Ken, or do I need to call Holly on the phone? Somebody saw her. That's good. Okay. We got that? Good. All right. The motion passes uh, with one nay and the rest yays. Last item on the agenda, public hearing to consider the request to Provision Investments, LLC, for a preliminary plot approval of a Bishop Road multiple occupancy project, seven units. And let's see who we have on that. Uh, Samara, you're up, madam. Okay, can we see the screen? Yes, uh, yes we can. You're a lot quicker than okay. Buford also, but don't tell Buford I said that. This is the Bishop Road MOP, case 2027. It's a public hearing to consider the request of provision investments for a preliminary approval of Bishop Road MOP, 
a seven unit multiple occupancy project. The project is approximately 1.08 acres and is located on the west side of Bishop Road, just north of Gaffer Road. Mr. Larry Smith, a PE of SE Civil, serves as engineer of record for this application. This is our subject site near the intersection of Bishop and Gaffer Road. The property is zoned R4. And here is our aerial. And this is our site plan. The applicant has provided a site plan illustrating two proposed buildings on a 1.08 acre property. There are seven units total with a gross density of 6.42 units per acre. The site plan illustrates a sidewalk along Bishop Road. There is a total of 22 parking spaces provided. Each unit will have a single car garage and there's also an uncovered parking space in the driveway. Lastly, a new fire hydrant will be installed within the required 450 feet. And this is just some site data to the right. Here is an elevation of the proposed building. Here's our landscape plan. Um, you will see that there are uh, trees proposed along um, the perimeter as well as in the front of the property. Green space. Um, this project does satisfy the green space requirement. They have provided uh, 0.44 acres of green space and the requirement, the requirement is 0.27. And this is just your drainage, drainage plan, um, just confirming that it does meet the uh, flow requirements. Staff recommends preliminary plat approval of SD 20.27 Bishop Road MOP, subject to the following conditions. Replat of lots one and two into a single lot prior to any land disturbance activities. I do want to note that staff was contacted on last week and the replat is forthcoming. Okay, so that can be done at the staff level then, obviously? Correct. Okay, good. All right. Um, members, do you have any questions for Samara at this point? Uh, <clears throat> this is John Worsh. Am I just uh, going back to what we did the first with the first uh, item is that you know the requirement is not 450 feet within the of the plot line it's 450 feet from the last uh, hydrant so and I you know I don't see any hydrant on any of these plans uh, Mr. Smith is in on this call if you can um, remind us where it is I believe it's right here if I'm correct it may be blurry on the screen well, it just says a capped iron rod. Let's see. No, no. Um, we, I think y'all are just given one of the many sheets that we actually submit to the staff for their review and approval. We're installing a new fire hydrant in front of um, the property. And um, so um, given our, our frontage is only 224 feet of frontage and we're sticking a fire hydrant right next to our entrance, um, we'll be well within any type of spacing for the um, for the MOP um, but there is a utility sheet that's I guess not in y'all's package it, it is uh, right we do have it we just included the site plan today but we do have the utility sheet okay. yeah does that meet the 450 mm -hmm. feet from the from the fire hydrant or at the corner of uh, Gafer and Bishop that has not been uh, i'm sorry the, the uh, i was going to say the corner of gafer and bishop is 150 feet away from our property and okay. so we will be um we'll we'll have one at that intersection then we'll have one within our site we were just short of um, making it all the way past our site without having to install another hydrant so we went ahead and added that hydrant okay Thank you, Larry. Any other questions for Samara? 
John, are you you okay with that, John? I, yeah, I am. I'm good. Okay. Um, in that case, I'll see Larry. Do you have anything else to add at this point? I uh, did not. Samara did a great job presenting the case, so I don't have any additional uh, comments. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for Larry at this point? If not, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. This is a seven unit multiple occupancy project. It is on the west side of Bishop Road, just south of Gafer. If anybody from the public wishes to speak to this item, just unmute at this time. Nobody um, got on the list with Emily, but if you do wish to speak, now is your chance. All right, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing at this time and turn the meeting over to the commissioners. I have a uh, uh, motion, Mr. Chairman. This is Art. Case number SD20.27, Bishop Road, MOP, Multiple Occupancy Project. I move that uh, we approve subject to staff recommendation. I've got a motion to approve subject to staff recommendation. Do I have a second? This is Harry Kohler. I second that. Yeah. All right. I have a motion and a second. Any further any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Um, oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm requested by Emily to do a roll call. Here we go. Art? Yeah. Rebecca? Aye. Harry? Aye. John? Aye. Aye for me, Holly? Thumbs up. I can't see Holly. Can anybody see Holly? Can we, Earth to Holly. Can we rec, uh, minimize these recommendation here? Samir, go ahead and quit sharing your screen for me, please. Um, Richard Peterson. There she is. Oh, there she is. Um, Holly, can you give us a thumbs up? She did. All right, that'll be your eye. Uh, Clarice. Aye. And finally, Kevin. Aye. All right, motion passes unanimously. Um, let's see here. Next item on the agenda is um, informal review 20.2, a multiple occupancy, uh, excuse me. Um, this is informal. Yeah, 20 point, uh, informal 20.02. Let me find it here. Oh, I don't have anything on that. Okay, 20 point. This should be it. This should be here. Okay. Um, There's a presentation from Barbara Childress for a informal review for uh, 9201 County Road 11. Or that's the address of the property owner. We'll just see what's what's up. Yeah. Yeah, come, come on up and let us know what you're Hi. looking at. Thank you all for seeing us. Uh, my name is Tammy Barber. My mother is Barbara Childress. Um, I'm her oldest daughter. My mother owns a piece of property, one of her pieces of property on County Road 11. Can you speak to the, into the microphone or nobody can hear you? My mother owns a piece of property on County Road 11. She inherited it from her mother, farmland originally. Um, it's 17 acres. Currently, my sister has a home on one acre that was given to her by my parents. My sister also has an, another acre out of that she owns that was given to another sister. My sister didn't want it, gave it to that sister. So of that 17 acres, I have one sister who has a home on one acre and she owns another acre. I also have another sister who my mother built a home for on another acre on that property. I have a nephew, my mother's grandson, who has a mobile home on that property in the back. He wishes to build a house on that property. My mother has decided rather than doing a will, she wants to deed her heirs, her properties. She wants to leave the grandson one acre of land 
so he can build that mobile home. And he wants, she wants to divide the rest of the land between the two sisters that are there, the two daughters. So currently, basically the one sister has two pieces of property there and my mother has the rest. So really, my mother wants to divide her property Go for it, into man. three pieces. Have, have your, the sister's property been subdivided already? Um, you know, it was deeded to her 25 years ago. They deeded her an acre of land. So they gave her the deed, has it been recorded? And the deed was recorded, taxes? 25, given to her by my parents 25 years ago. I, I, can't, I can't say that I know. Sure. I, I didn't even know this existed until my mother sold. We didn't even know this situation with Fairhope existed until six months ago when my mother attempted to deed my brother an acre he was living on on a piece of property she needed to sell. So we didn't even know the situation with Fairhope existed with property in Baldwin County until we sure. realized it in selling another piece of property. You know, whenever a property is divided, it's supposed to be subdivided either by the county or by the city. And there have been cases when, you know, I've been told where, you know, deeds are transferred without a subdivision, which gets to be, you know, a pretty tricky item you know, legally. Um, on this, my, my suggestion would be to take this to to the city staff and, you know, get some ideas on how that can be subdivided. It's real difficult for us to do subdivisions that don't meet subdivision regulations, but then we've had a lot of these occurrences come to us recently with family subdivisions and we're actually working on, you know, Buford at our office has been working on family subdivisions. As a matter of fact, Buford, didn't you and Ken have a long discussion on family subdivisions this past week? Am I correct in that? That is affirmative, Mr. Chairman. So, and you're going to see, you're going to see some of the byproduct of that discussion in probably about 10 minutes when we get to the uh, proposed amendments. Well, uh, hello, Mr. Buford. It's Tammy Barber again. I did meet with them and get to speak with them. I, I guess my request for this informal meeting with you all is, obviously, we are a farm family. Um, obviously, you know, my mother sold property for reasons. She's elderly. We're not wealthy. Um, subdividing property is extremely expensive. We're not wealthy developers. <laughs> I, so, I rode bus number 14 so, <laughs> from Turkey Branch with about 15 <laughs> children to the school every morning. There you so. go. So, <laughs> um, you know, she, she, she literally wants to, and this is the only piece of property that she will need to divide. You know, the other properties, you know, won't require division. Sure. So before we secure, and I've already communicated with surveyors, and that kind of thing. We, we want to be, know that we can do it before we go to all that expense. So that, I guess that's why I was requesting this informal meeting. Yeah, I mean, I would just suggest talking to the staff and seeing what the recommendation would be, because if we get a negative staff recommendation and a plan that doesn't meet, you know, a lot of the subdivision regs, it makes it very problematic for us to approve something. Well, I'm kind of blown out of the water in hearing, just being able to sit here and hear what you all are saying about these other subdivisions with fire hydrants. You know, I'm, I'm like, I don't know that there's fire hydrants in farmland out in the country. You know, all of that's country farmland out there. I know we've got. I mean, the, I, I don't. Uh, recommend, we, we're, we have letters from Barnwell Fire Department begging us to uh -huh. implement those. Yeah. So when there's new lights created, make sure they're on the and, and, and the concern is that it's farmland now, but as you're subdividing it, it's coming out of farmland. And I'm talking to some farmers out in that general area that are, you know, getting less and less land that will probably have to move elsewhere as more and more land gets developed when you're, 
you know, get 23 cents a pound for peanuts and somebody would pay you 50,000 an acre for your land, it's hard to grow peanuts anymore right now. And yeah, without that's moving sad, to the really black belt, and it is, and then times are changing. But, you know, as these lots get subdivided, it's coming out of farmland. You know, my dad, you'll hear talk about, you know, when Bel Air Mall was farmland and all of Spring Hill. And, you know, it's not like that anymore. But my suggestion, and if any commissioners want to chime in, feel free, but I would suggest talking to Buford and, and seeing, and hopefully this family subdivision, these family subdivision that we're talking about coming up with will provide some relief for, you know, what y'all are So y'all going to discuss it further? Uh, not your specific item, but or we're going to discuss in the general? family subdivision. Okay. All yes, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And, Lee, I want to make just, just highlight that we're a couple of, well actually four months behind on this because before all the virus and quarantine hit we had a scheduled work session to discuss this we very did. topic so with everything that's happened that's kind of delayed us and, and we're, we're going to be picking up that conversation now thank you thank you hunter um and, and that is something that we have had a lot of people ask us about that there's a lot of concern in the area about that we do certainly need to address um, moving into four old and new business. Um, first item is SD 18.39 Fox Hollow Phase 3. Um, actually, Mr. Chairman, uh, Buford, are you available? Yes, I can hear you. And, uh, and thank you, Emily and Chairman Commissioners. The, uh, um, the, uh, as you can see before you is a request for a two-year extension of a preliminary plat approval and and commissioners my recollection is is generally the planning commission um prefers to these for the Buford, planning commission on. prefers for this to be one year hey, rather hey, than two Buford. hey Buford we actually um need to hear the previous case first um the one for um SD 1810, the replat of Lot 2, Young Oaks, sidewalk discussion from last okay. month. That would be the one we need to hear first. It was left off the agenda. We're sorry about that. Oh, well, I'm <laughs> I was wondering. Wait, 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 wait. What is that? <laughs> it's not listed on our agenda. SD 1810. Oh, the sidewalk on the Nichols sidewalk Avenue. sidewalk discussion on Nichols. Okay, yes. Buford, do you want to bring that up and then we'll go to Fox Hollow? This is out on uh, Nichols and Bishop Road. Um, the subdivision was done. I, I, I won't steal Buford's thunder. Go ahead, Buford. Uh, commissioners, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. And, and, and commissioners, thank you. And Emily, thank you for jumping in there. So, so yes, sequentially, we need to consider this first or discuss it first. And so this is a subdivision, uh, a minor subdivision that was approved about two years ago and bear with me just a moment here so lot two young oak subdivision that was a resubdivision from about two years ago there is the plat and you can see that is an approved recorded plat so commissioners i'll just get right into the issue and we try we discussed this very briefly at the conclusion of last meeting and because of the late hour it was um, better to consider it today so as you can see, that subdivision was approved on the 2nd of April of 2018. You see some of the information right there. Two lot minor, R3 PGH is the, uh, is the zoning district, and the slide number is listed there. Now, the Planning Commission added a condition of approval. Sidewalks shall be installed along Nichols Avenue. And so the applicant provided to the city a performance bond agreement as well as a check for $2,613. And so that was basically an aid to construction fee for the city to install those sidewalks as required by the Planning Commission. Um, and that was approved by the Public Works Director based upon uh, his schedule of values. Um, the Public Works Director, Mr. Johnson, has informed staff that plans for sidewalk construction along Nichols Avenue have been suspended and further sidewalk construction is not planned. Um, so the applicant is requesting a refund of their $2,613 due to not installation of the sidewalks. Now, because that was a specific requirement of the planning condition, planning commission via condition of approval, staff presents this refund request to the planning commission for their consideration if they wish to take any action. 
I think the sidewalk should be built. I mean, since that subdivision was done two years ago, um, I think this this week a uh, restaurant slash bar is being opened across the street from a restaurant. We're allowing commercial buildings to go in there. Um, there are some plans for sidewalks on Nichols further to the west. And, you know, that area has pedestrians walking at night. We've got people coming out of the Fairhope Brewery drinking. We've got people coming out. I don't know the name of the new place, but it looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, and it's got a bar in there and a restaurant. And that area is being, uh, you know, is it, kind of becoming a mix of retail and and uh, commercial, you know, retail restaurant. And I don't think we need people walking in the roads in Nichols. I get a little uncomfortable when we say, hey, this area is zoned industrial. So, you know, who cares if we put retail in there? You know, no big deal. But, you know, there's a difference between industrial where you're expecting 18 wheelers to come in and go out versus, you know, retail and restaurant where you've got pedestrians walking around, you know, with kids and people drinking crossing the streets. and you know, I think sidewalks and street lights are nice things in those areas. And I, I remember when that was approved, I felt like sidewalks should have been on Nichols then, and I feel like they should be there now. So I, I don't think we should do a refund. That's just my, my view. Um, and I agree with Mr. Chairman. I know that may sound like it's contradictory. Well, that's, that's, I might get this in writing. But, if he, but, but you know, and, and we charge connection fees for water and sewer too, but that doesn't mean every time somebody gives us a connection fee, we're going to start progress on a new water plant or wastewater expansion. I mean, I just don't see that as being a, an issue. I mean, yeah, it'll be built one day and, and he's done what it, he, he needed to do to get a subdivision approved the way I see it. All right. Well, yes, sir. I'm David Cooper, and I own 8407 Nichols Avenue. Yes, sir. And I'm the person that wrote the check for $2,613. Um, it's my understanding that when it was proposed to begin the building of the sidewalk, that there was an objection from the residents along Hawthorne Glen. Um, and due to drainage issues, they were it, the idea was abandoned. I was also told by the Single Tax Corporation that they had taken it up as a project to build that sidewalk and that since uh, the commission, I believe I was told that the commission had decided not to build the sidewalk on Nichols. Hey, I'm all for the sidewalk. I would love to. I've got two small grandchildren and I'd love to see it be built. Huh? But there's no sidewalk to the west of me all the way up to uh, the, new, uh, the new restaurant you're talking about and they have no sidewalk. So I don't know where the sidewalk is going to begin other than my property. Um, I think it should be, the complete road should be a sidewalk. There was a presentation made to the Single Tax Corporation to build a sidewalk there, and some people came out of the subdivision and requested that it be made, and some people came out of the subdivision and requested that it not be made. But that was a request for a project for the Single Tax Corporation, and they chose not to do that as a project since there were mixed feelings by the people in Hollowbrook, which is a single tax subdivision. But that doesn't necessarily mean that sidewalks are a good idea there or not. That just means that, you know, one nonprofit 501c4 organization decided as a project not to spend their money to build sidewalks there. They are going to build sidewalks further down Nichols. Uh, coming up probably next month and they're building sidewalks out of Gayford just trying to make the area nicer. But at some point that project could come back to the single tax or the city of Fairhope could just decide tomorrow that they want to build sidewalks there. That's up to the city, you know, when they want to build the sidewalks and at their pleasure. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm a resident of Hawthorne Glen and, and I, I know that walking Nichols, especially after a rain event, is very difficult. And I think in order to do the sidewalk properly. The drainage has to be improved on Nichols before we start talking about sidewalks. And I think that is likely why they're not trying to put sidewalks in today. 
because I think there is a significant drainage problem there that we need to address before we worry about sidewalks. And then we can have the total package at that time. But I don't even know, Ken, are we even the, the organization that makes decisions as to whether or not to refund money? That doesn't sound like a, that sounds more like a city council issue, not a planning and zoning issue. We were required that sidewalks be built to have the property subdivided and the sidewalks were not built. So I, I don't even know about if that's even would be considered a legal subdivision if they did not meet the requirements of the subdivision. But if the city later chose $2,613 in lieu of, um, I mean, do we have the right? I don't know if we use the P and Z, that sounds more like a city council mayor issue to me than P and Z. In my 20 years, I haven't voted on whether or not to refund fees in the 20 years I've sat here. Yeah, we are kind of in uncharted water as far as my tenure with y'all as well, which is going on four years now. There's no procedural device in the regulations for consideration of this request. What it sounds like is the Planning Commission required sidewalks. The owner or developer thought they were going to achieve that goal by the city, perhaps in hand with fair single tax, putting the sidewalks in and, and ponied up $2,500 to aid in that effort. But that effort's fallen by the wayside under the I don't see that as a, a reason to excuse the uh, the development from the requirement initially imposed by the by the commission to to install the sidewalk. It they was, need more I, time because because they thought they were going to get it accomplished via this aid to construction approach. I think the the city could could. I mean, the commission could extend the time to allow them to comply with that condition. Uh, and Ken, let me, uh, and Buford, both you and Ken, correct me if I'm wrong, but wouldn't the instrument be to amend the subdivision requirements to take away that requirement, which then would negate the reason for the bond? Not, not saying that is what to do or not do, but... If, if, if the decision is for the Planning Commission, I think that would be the instrument. It would be a, a, an amendment to a subdivision case. To remove, uh, to remove retroactively a requirement of the approval? Or would that be a new subdivision case to come in and... Are we st we're st aren't we still within the two-year period? No. And, no, no, we we just passed that. Just outside the two-year period. No. And and commissioners, if I can interject, um, and it wasn't done here, and this is not casting stones at anyone, but since we're on topic here, this is why you're seeing and why you saw today that we that we at the staff level said, commissioners, on these issues, on these types of subdivisions where there's something that might have to be installed, why we would say, if you approve it, approve it as a preliminary plat, because then we have a clear course of action to install improvements within two years. Um, we didn't have the benefit of that in this case, again, not casting stones, but um, since that was relevant, I wanted to bring that up. Um, because then it's very clear how you handle that going forward. Um, as Ken said, we're kind of in no man's land here because there's not a real procedural way to do this. I suppose the applicant could petition the city council for a refund um, uh, would be the only other a uh, 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 avenue I could see. Then it simply becomes an enforcement question for the commission. I mean, if the subdivision is built out of compliance with a with a condition of the approval, you know, the commission has enforcement authority if it chooses to to exercise it. What are those, what are the enforcement options, Ken? Are you, I never had occasion to implement it, but either through the building department or through the courts, we would, we would require them to build the sidewalks. Mr. Chairman, um, Richard Johnson was previously here um, and he had to leave 
before this case came up, he has indicated to staff as the public works director that he is prepared to send a crew out and build these sidewalks. Well, I don't see any question then. I think the sidewalks will be there personally. Well, when can we start building? That's up to the city. If it were up to me, it would already been built. If it were up to me, you wouldn't have had your subdivision until after it was built. But well, Up to me, I, I would have loved to have seen it built already. So I can we start soon? I'd talk to Richard Johnson on that. I'm not the city. Yeah, city. Richard Johnson's your man. He so if Richard Johnson tells me he can build a sidewalk, we can start building the sidewalk. He has indicated to staff um, last week that he would send a crew out as soon as possible. Excellent. All right. Okay. Thank and you. we'll start building a sidewalk. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. All right. Next item on the agenda, SD 1839, Fox Hollow Phase 3. Um, Buford, do you have anything else to add to that? That'll be me. Okay. This is Emily Boyette. And... Uh, the request has come from Montrose Properties, the owner and applicant of the property for Fox Hollow Phase 3. Um, this subdivision is approximately 13.78 acres. It's zoned R2, and it was developed, approved for 32 lots. The preliminary plat approval was granted by the Planning Commission November 5th, 2018. The applicant has requested a two-year extension of the preliminary plat approval. Um, however, staff recommendation is just to grant a one-year extension. Yeah, um, I talked to the applicant and asked the reason for the extension, and um, <clears throat> he said with the COVID situation that it looked like sales might slow down out there, and that their real concern is that when they connected Fox Hollow to, what's the name of the contiguous Eddington to, to place. Eddington Place. He said they were very cognizant to have their houses be the quality of Eddington Place and that when you go from Eddington to Fox Hollow that you really don't notice any difference in the quality of the street lights, the sidewalks, the houses or anything and, and that the people in Eddington have been very pleased with that plus Fox Hollow and he does not, you know, wanted you know all of a sudden dump the additional lots on the market and have some volume builder come and buy them up and you know do something that would diminish the values of fox hollow as well as eddington place so he would rather have a two-year extension just so they can go forward slowly um in the past what we have done is we've only allowed one year voted one year extensions but then we have voted as an additional one-year extension and never gone more than two years as far as my memory is that correct emily that is correct jeremy so in the past we've always said we'll we'll grant a one-year extension and then if they come back again we've normally without any major changes done one more year and then after that all bets are off um so commissioners do you have any issue with that or any concerns i think we've had a couple of these at least since i've been on the commission on the commission and I think it's been a one year. I don't see what the issue is. It ought to be a, it ought to be a year, just as we have the precedent we've set. Mm -hmm. And if they want to come back uh, at the end of that year and request another one, so be it. And they've got a maximum of two years. Do you want to make that in the form of a motion? I just did. Okay, I've got a motion to grant Fox Hollow a one-year extension and that they can come back if they want to request another year after that. Do I have a second? I second it, Ms. Richard. Thank you, Richard. Any further discussion? Roll call. Um, we'll do this on a roll call again. Uh, Art obviously is a yay. He made the motion. Yeah. Rebecca? Yeah. Yay. Harry? Yay. John? Yay. Uh, yay for myself, Holly? Can anybody see her? Uh, Buford, if you'll pull your presentation off for a second. Right. Holly, you with us? Can you right. turn your camera on? All right. <laughs> um, I'll, we'll come back to Holly. Um, Richard Peterson, <laughs> there she is. we got a thumbs up for Holly. I, Holly, we want you to learn sign language between now and our next meeting, please. Uh, Richard Peterson is obviously it. a yay. He seconded the motion. Uh, Clarice? Yay. And Kevin? Yay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. 
Uh, next item on the agenda, subdivision regulation amendment discussion. Buford? Okay, commissioners, rejoining you. Uh, commissioners, first of all, to first of all, let me underscore the following. This is not for consideration tonight. Um, not for consideration. This is just rolling out to you for the first time. This is quite comprehensive. It touches on several different things. Some of the things you're going to see are routine amendments to clarify wording. Some of these, uh, some of the things are, are pretty drastic changes, so we'll just jump right in. We'll just jump right in. First of all, just simply adding a, a, a date of last amendment to the cover. Pretty straightforward. That's something that we've had several requests about. In Article Two definitions, um, and this is something Ken Watson helped us out, uh, helped us with, is that uh, uh, you see the definition of a lot. Um, adding the following text: designation of land as a tax parcel by the Baldwin County Revenue Commission does not establish a lot of record within the meaning of these regulations. And Ken can jump in here and correct me if I misstate this, but in brief, uh, just bolstering the definition because there's a lot of confusion and conflict between what is a lot and what is a tax parcel. And so uh, this will support some of the other amendments we have. Um, and I'll pause for a second if anyone has questions. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, so what you're, what you're saying is if you've got a tax plat and you've got several parcels and some of them are small parcels in the county they have historically said uh any parcel is is basically a lot and what you're saying is we can be doing something different than that no it, what's so, happened is people have gone to the county and transferred deeds without getting them subdivided and and so then it causes a real issue that somebody you know, has been paying property tax on something and thinks they have a lot when it's never been subdivided. And that's something that we're ta and talked with the, with the, you know, revenue commissioner about in currently. Okay, but, but you're talking about a previously platted, a previously platted, uh, uh, previously platted properties. However, I'm not talking about something current, but but from back in the 1920s, I think I'm, I'm thinking about down uh, along the bay, uh, Bowers Wharf, Point Clear area where you've got small lots that were already established. What you're telling me is those are those, those can be developed or, or, or built on, or they cannot. And commissioners, <laughs> I think it'll be a bit. Uh, and, and and Ken, jump in, and I, and I'll I'll shut up here real quickly. This is a source of enormous confusion because um, there are lots and parcels that don't match. And, um, and we see this a lot in the fruit and nuts part of town. And so this, def this, little, this additional sentence here will bolster something else we'll show you here in just a moment. And, uh, and Ken, jump in. Ken, jump in when you get ready. Oh, sure. Hey, Art, you remember down there off Volanta, um, one we had three or four years ago where I think back in the teens maybe there was a recorded plat made yeah. there were conveyances with respect to that then at some point you know 60 80 years ago someone started conveying by meets and mat bounds and then wanted to call those meets and, and combined I think some lots or maybe split some lots up and wanted to call that the lot uh, and and as good as the revenue commissioner's information is as a starting point to get information about ownership and where the land is and how it lies in relation to other land it's very useful people have come to think that merely because a piece of land frequently conveyed by meets and bounds gets red lines drawn around it and put on a put on the revenue commissioner's website well that's a lot of record for subdivision regulation purposes and we're simply making it clear that is not the case if as in your question someone recorded a plat at the courthouse showing lots down on the bay or wherever they are yes those are lots of record and the conveyances should be uh, with reference to those plans 
and they are developable lots as to yes. the understanding yes. of that. Yes, they are. Okay. All right, I'm with you. Okay, and, and moving on if we can. Okay, so in uh, Article 4, the pre-application and sketch plat. So commissioners will recall about, about 18 months ago, we added the requirement for the community meeting, which I think is enormously beneficial. Um, this is just a, a, a minor amendment, but we think procedurally it will, it, will, it will save some unnecessary meetings. So if you'll notice in paragraph B, except as noted in 2 below, and that should say, that should be a Roman numeral. If you look at the red text at the bottom, subdivisions preceded by the creation of a planned unit development are not required to conduct an additional community, meet, community meeting prior to submission of a subdivision preliminary plan. So um, uh, if you're creating a PUD and then you're going through the subdivision process to carry out that PUD, you have already gone through numerous meetings and public hearings. That additional community meeting for the subdivision is a bit redundant. And Buford, let me ask a quick question of the commission here. Uh, that community meeting is an instrument of the subdivision regulations. Uh, it is not in the zoning code. For, so for PUDs, for exa example, the developer doesn't have to go to the community before it comes. Is that something we should mirror in the zoning code? I don't think so. If we're not going to require it for the subdivision afterwards, then, you know, and for, a, for a, those meetings seem to really be nice. They clear a lot of people out because a lot of people get their answers, you know, questions answered prior to here. Plus, once the developers put a lot of money into developing something, he's a lot less liable to make a change when he can make a simple change on the front end a lot of times that appeases, you know, appeases people before they get to us. Okay, Commissioner's moving on. Hey, Buford, Buford. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Didn't we, didn't we talk about some um, a time frame or in some manner tightening the language up so that we are talking about relatively recently approved PUDs, not one that's been hanging around for years and years and years, and now and now are you know, have finally decided what to do with a part of that PUD. Ken, we could cure that real easily. We could simply say that you don't require that community meeting um, for a subdivision if the PUD has already had a community meeting. Just make it that simple. So in other words, any PUD done prior to a community meeting would be required to have it on the subdivision level. Otherwise, they wouldn't be required to. Well, and Mr. Chairman, we also did create a, um, that did get approved, right? <laughs> Where there's now a sunset clause for PUDs, so. But, but not for the PUDs prior to the sunset clause. Right, right. but that would eliminate the, the new ones from having to go through that. They're going to expire. That's true. And commissioners, I think that the, the number of PUDs that are sitting dormant is very minimal right now but but I thank Ken for that comment we'll come up with uh, we'll work with Ken and come up uh, come up with a way to better word that so that way we don't ignore those because I can think of two PUDs right now um, that have not been constructed and it would be appropriate for those to have uh, their community meeting when they get ready to either have an MOP or a subdivision so we'll, we'll work on that and, and, and improve that wording Okay, we'll move on. Um, commissioners here in Article 4, the plat approval procedures. Um, this is simply clarifying something that we get, that we do receive, but making it very explicit what we want, and that is ESRI ArcMap shapefiles, which are the, the files we use for GIS maps. And so adding to that requirement for final plats that we get ESRI ArcMap shapefiles, including but not limited to locations of street center lines, sidewalk center lines, curb lines, including the back of the curb, property corners, lot lines, and edge of pavement. We're getting shapefiles already for utility purposes, uh, but this would be extremely beneficial to have these items um, at the final plat. And since 
this, all of these items are essentially created in AutoCAD or a similar format already. It's simply a matter of then recreating the ESRI ArcMap shape files that go with them. Uh, so that'll be tremendously beneficial if we receive that. So more of a technical requirement right there. Okay, we'll move on. So, uh, commissioners, we're getting into the heart of really what we want to talk about tonight um, in Article 4 procedure exceptions. And so here, talking about the minor subdivision process, four or fewer lots. Um, and this cleans up the wording a bit because we use the term infrastructure quite a bit um, anecdotally without really defining it. And so this bolsters that right there. Um, there are no new streets of right of way, no new utility mains required, or any other public infrastructure here and after streets or infrastructure. So just bolster that definition a bit for minor subdivisions and also give us a definition of infrastructure. If you notice at the end of, of item two right there, additionally, a replat may be required by the planning director to resolve discrepancies between lots of record and tax parcels comprising multiple lots. Now that very simple sentence helps us tremendously because here's a scenario we see all the time. Um, and it goes back to Ken and Art's comments earlier. Someone purchases a piece of property and they, are, and they do not realize they're actually purchasing two pieces of property that had never been replatted into a single. Um, our building official and our building requirements do not allow construction across lot lines. So whenever we discover these types of situations, this is one way that we can require from a subdivision standpoint that someone correct those issues and take two lots and replat them into a single lot and make it a bona fide lot of record that the current setbacks are applied to and that the structure they wish to construct is shown on a properly recorded plat that is now a lot of record. And so this is basically a cleanup procedure, but it gives us the ability, it gives us an actual uh, authority to require it. Okay, okay so moving on. Okay, commissioners, um, this is something we've spent a ton of time researching. I appreciate Ken Watson's help with this. Um, and we've gone back and forth about how to handle the family subdivision situation. I don't think this is a silver bullet that will cure all issues, but it is a step in the right direction. Um, this mirrors the one-time split mirrors but does not identically replicate the county's procedure and other cities procedures um, so let's talk terminology super quick family subdivision is not a terminology that we can use at the city level because of how the statutes are created at the state level that's a power the counties have not a power the city planning commissions have so in light of that Let's use the proper terminology. So a one-time split of a single lot slash parcel into two lots may be approved administratively by the planning director is her authorized agent without review by the planning commission, provided that the lot or parcel has not been divided since March 8, 2007. They must provide information require, uh, uh, to, to demonstrate that it hasn't been subdivided since then. That reflects the date of adoption of the current subdivision regulations. Using our, new in, using our new infrastructure word. No new streets or public infrastructure is required. The, the resulting lots and the and, and commissioners, the, this, the, uh, uh, the bullet points will be corrected, obviously. The resulting lots will be in compliance with all applicable provisions of these regulations or will be brought into compliance. So for example, someone needs a fire hydrant. We grant them subdivision approval with the condition they install the fire hydrant, they install the fire hydrant, we may even grant them or recommend granting them uh, a preliminary plat. They install the fire hydrant, come back, get their final plat approval, then go and record the plat. So we'll be brought into compliance. And Ken, forgive me if I butchered that. Submittals for one-time split shall in all other respects meet the minimum requirements of these regulations. So if you've, if you've got the, the frontage, the lot width, the lot size, that sort of thing, and you want to take one lot and cut and cut it in and cut it up into two pieces, 
you can if this is approved they can get they can have uh, it gives staff um, gives a planning director administrative approval for this they would not have to come to the planning commission now property undergoing a one-time split may not be subdivided for X years after such one-time split we felt it would be appropriate to let the let the let the planning commission contemplate how many years X years can be I figure it probably two at least one uh, but that's something that we can that's something we can debate at an appropriate time this is just rolling it out for the planning commission um, and I'll pause here for any questions or comments. Uh, I've got some thoughts, but I'm not going to bring them up right now. I'll just I'll send out an email to you, Buford, on it. And Lee, we because we, I, I think the biggest issue that people are trying to get to in a in these family subdivisions, I don't think the issue is that they really give a darn if they have to come to us or if they can get the staff approval. Certainly, it would save some time, energy, and money for them to be able to get the staff approval. But I think the crux of the matter is those subdivisions don't meet the subdivision regs. Like when the McKenzie's came in today and, you know, they've kind of given this person this acre and that person that acre. The problem is, is more, and I don't want to get into this real heavily right now, but the problem is more the 100 feet on a front frontage road, you know, um, fire hydrants and those kinds of things i mean we're a minimal cost but if you're requiring somebody to do a, a sure enough road with a hundred feet of public access and a fire hydrant you know with the water and sewer running for you know 800 yards through somebody's you know back 40 to get to the one acre parcel they gave to the person on the creek you know you might be talking about seventy five thousand dollars of infrastructure for a forty thousand dollar lot and I think that's the issues that people have. I don't think it's who does the approval is I think they're trying to get around the subdivision regulations by saying, hey, you know, in this case, this is just a family subdivision. And, you know, there's been a trailer on this acre for the past seven years. And Mama always said that, you know, little John could have that acre. But now to give it to him, we're going to have to go through all the, you know, big bad wolves requirements and it's going to cost one hundred twenty thousand dollars to give him a you know a forty thousand dollar acre with the he's been living on for eight years already i think those are the issues where we hear the complaints so i don't know how much will clear up but but i don't want to get heavily into that now i'll send some ideas out via email and i think the biggest question is from a city standpoint what items do we wish to waive for family subdivisions from what items do we not wish to waive? Because I think I that's believe that is something Buford and I talked about at length, and that and I, I agree with you. That's probably the biggest part of this is how to allow this minor minor subdivision uh, approve it administratively, and what in that context is appropriately what provisions of the subdivision regulations are appropriately. Uh, made exempt, uh, but it is in part uh, the cost of it, and just having to deal with the government to, to as you say, just to give an acre to my grandson. Uh, there's, there's a lot going on here. Uh, as Buford said, we just wanted to get it out there and get some feedback from y'all. And Ken, uh, uh, make sure this is this suggestion is okay, and I'm not sure if the planning commission would entertain it. But Buford and I were talking and. This is a difficult thing to discuss at the end of a meeting. It is. And it's also difficult to schedule other work sessions. It may be if, if the Planning Commission would, would be willing to create an ad hoc committee that can dissolve quickly, but a few people willing to get into the weeds on this code and debates, and we can do that virtually. We can do that by phone call. You know, in kind of maybe an hour at a time instead of trying to hit a marathon session. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. I think I can send an email out that would address, you know, in the 20 years I've been on here, the, I've heard the same complaints over and over again about the lack of the family subdivision. And the main issues is the road frontage. But I can, rather than right now, I can put that out in an email and see, you know, areas that the city feels comfortable maybe making an exception because i mean in a lot of these cases you know the moms were here meeting before last and in a lot of these cases you know like the mckenzie's just said you know people have lived 
you know, in a house or in a trailer on that property for seven, eight years already and just want it memorialized, to use Buford's word, that it's their lot, you know. So I've got some ideas I can send out in the email and see what Ken and Buford think about those and what the other commissioners think. And commissioners, we'll move on, but uh, um, I really like Hunter's idea, and that's something the commission may want to consider is having an ad hoc committee for this type of thing. So uh, uh, consider that, and we'll we'll talk uh, when we when we get through when we get through the slides. We'll talk about next steps, but uh, we'll we'll do that once we get to the end. These are to me these are the types of issues, and I agree. I, I guess that was Hunter that said that, but you know when you get into a situation like at the end of a meeting, a regular scheduled meeting, and now you're going to sit here and, and, and talk about that, I'd much rather give a couple of hours in an afternoon deal with this separate and apart than to, than to sit down at the end of a meeting and, and try to make sense out of a lot of these. And I'll t with that in mind, commissioners, and that's a great comment. Let's do this. Let's try to let me try to get through this pretty quickly, um, and roll it out to you. And then, and then once once we get through this, we can talk about next steps. So, respecting that, this is basically just a routine edit, since we're using that term public infrastructure. Okay. This is an approval standards. This is an approval standards, and uh, I'll thank Ken for his assistance with here. Uh, this is where we get this basically bolter, bolsters health, safety, welfare. So notwithstanding that the proposed subdivision may satisfy the technical, technical objective provision of these regulations, the commission has discretion to deny a subdivision if there is any articulable, rational basis for a determination that the proposed subdivision otherwise endangers the health, safety, or welfare of persons or property. So bolstering that definition a bit, uh, bolstering that definition a bit, and Ken, jump in if you if you would like to uh, elaborate. I'd be happy to, but at this point, I'll just adhere to the admonishment that let's introduce them to these things, and we'll get into more detail at their pleasure. Sounds great. So moving on, um, commissioners, we won't get into the weeds. Let me explain what we're doing here. So we've had several requests for some adding some clarity to the green, green space requirements. So what we're presenting to you here, what this will do is basically there are some areas where the word open space and green space are used interchangeably. This corrects, this corrects that uh, discrepancy. Also, it clarifies how green space is applied. Uh, the other thing here, and then this is something we can discuss in detail in an appropriate time, is for for MOPs such as RV parks, trailer parks, mobile home parks, manufactured home parks, tiny home developments, do we want to specifically and make it very clear that there are green space requirements for those types of MOPs? Again, discuss it at an appropriate time. Okay, this right here, less than three units per acre, that sets a base of green space for MOPs there. We haven't had one, but you could basically have three, you could have a three unit MOP that due to its physical size would not trigger green space. This closes that gap. Okay, commissioners, this is what I'm, what I'm have for you here is a pretty drastic departure. And that is the developer may have the flexibility to construct sidewalks within two years of final plat approval, letter of credit, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of two years, all sidewalks shall be completed by either the developer using the letter of credit. This would strike that entirely. And so commissioners won't go on ad nauseum here, but we are facing a really, a really very, very challenging situation right now. And the best example as I can give you, I won't name names, but there's a subdivision that received final plat approval in 2013 and it still does not have all the sidewalks and street trees involved uh, uh, installed um, so that would be bolstered by uh, that would be bolstered by another item that we'll get to here momentarily and what this basically would require is that um, virtually all sidewalks would be installed at the time of final plan um, those would be covered on the maintenance bond not under a performance bond that's a pretty drastic departure um, here's some clarity on sidewalks in general. And so, again, rolling it out kind of quickly. This is basically 
putting into the subdivision regulations what we do from a what we're doing now from a practical standpoint. So sidewalks are not required to be installed in the right of way where all lots front on and have access to existing streets or roads. Such streets or roads are under the jurisdiction of another governing authority and that authority has prohibited the installation of sidewalks in the right of way. In such event, the commission may require the installation of sidewalks and easements along the margin of the lots adjacent to the right of way. It basically creates a regulation that we already follow. Second flavor of it, if so requested, the commission may waive the requirements to all the sidewalks in the discretion of the commission. They will not serve the intended purposes due to the absence of other sidewalks in proximity to the subdivision or due to topogra topographic conditions. In such case, the commission may require sidewalk easements along the margin of lots adjacent to the right of way to accommodate the installation of sidewalks in the future. So it gives you a regulatory basis for what we're already doing right now. But this way you can you can enforce or utilize this requirement without having a waiver. It becomes now a review item. And it, it becomes a matter of review and recommendation and not necessarily waiver. Okay. All right, moving on, lot access. Um, except in rural and agricultural subdivisions as provided in the area you notice right there. Uh, all lots, shall, and this is the battle we fight fight every day, it seems. All lots shall front upon, front upon a paved, publicly maintained street. Here's some additional wording to bolster that. May be accessed via such frontage, and be accessed via such frontage. The commission may, in its discretion, allow deviation from this where such frontage and access to each lot is unattainable or unsafe due to unusual characteristics of the property with respect to topographic or natural features or the location of existing roads or public infrastructure. In allowing such deviation, the commission may require the creation of easements to provide for safe and convenient access. So again, it's putting a regulatory allowance for what we're doing now when you have an isolated lot. And if I could just jump in here just a second, that's a pretty tight basis or grounds upon which y'all allowing a deviation uh, to be based on. Uh, again, that's something we really need the commission's input on. Are you? You know, it's probably less stringent than the waiver, the, the, the as written true waiver uh, provision, but it's still, you know, unattainable or unsafe is, could be still a pretty tight standard. And so while I, I, we are making an effort to have the regulations provide for the some of the decisions that I think the commission in the past has made and and, and done so following common sense, I think it's good if we have that provided for in the regulation, but we really need some help with the standard upon which you would allow a deviation from the frontage requirement. Okay. Okay. Commissioners, this, this, next, uh, this next one is a, is a routine, is a routine um, amendment uh, to correct a technical standard um, doesn't really just, just require a whole lot of discussion right there. Um, that's an engineering type of item. Thank you. And, uh, Richard Johnson helped point out to me. Uh, let's see. Okay, the sidewalks, um, really a cleanup sentence here. Uh, appendix, uh, Table 5.3, Appendix A of these regulations or is elsewhere provided for in these regulations. Um, so that allows what we talked about earlier to function, if I'm stating that correctly. Okay. okay. Um, so, uh, commissioners, we talked about ESRI ArcMap shape files, and this is in a different location. I don't want to go on ad nauseum about it too much, but this is not a redundancy. This requirement for ESRI ArcMap shape files is in the stormwater section, but this, again, we're making it very clear that we need um, ESRI arc map shape files, clearly not limited to locations of all storm drainage piping, structures, inlets, ponds, swales, ditches, any other forms of stormwater storage treatment or conveyance. Same situation. We get that captured in uh, shape files so that way we can put these in our city maps and know where all those structures are located. They're basically doing it already, but this makes it very explicit what we, what we need. 
commissioners, this is a kind of a routine cleanup, and the um, in the permanent monuments requirement of the subdivision regulations. And what this does basically is it it, it incorporates by reference the most recent edition of the Alabama Society of Professional Land Surveyors document, standard pra standards of practice for surveying the state of Alabama, with the technology available today. Um, really requiring that concrete monument as defined in here is really is really um, um, not necessary. Uh, the the pins that are placed at, at property corners are sufficient according to that standard. So this would uh, um, remove what is probably a um, um, uh, an antiquated standard. Okay. Okay. Going back to completion of subdivision requirement to complete improvements so this is going to clarify the final plat process and this is a pretty pretty major change um, as you'll notice subdivider shall be responsible for providing all required minimum improvements in the subdivision this may be accomplished by number one you install everything or number two 90 percent substantial completion of the total cost of the infrastructure that statement has been in the subdivision regulations for quite some time. 90% substantial completion of the total cost. But it did not specifically and explicitly define what we want. And so this is something, this, this is something that is a, a major issue for staff. So we're making it very clear. In that 90%, that means all asphalt wearing surfaces, all stormwater pipes, culverts, curbs, gutters, detention, retention ponds, LID techniques, all the drainage infrastructure, all electrical water and sanitary sewer lines, all electrical water and sanitary sewer mains, obviously the houses aren't built where you can run a lateral. Also, installation of all sidewalks in all common areas and installation of at least 90% of sidewalks in all other areas in the public right-of-way. Um, the non-installation of sidewalks is a major, major, major issue and because of current ADA requirements, we debated this about three years ago, um, but now it's more clear to staff, at least the planning staff, that we know at the time of final plat approval, if 90% of the sidewalks are installed, we know that those have met ADA. Um, I could go on ad nauseum about that, but this is something we really think we need. Okay. okay. Um, this just simply makes it very clear what is being done practically but has not been captured in the regulations. So just make it very clear, 10% of improvements remaining to be installed based upon a schedule of value submitted by the engineer of record included with the request for final plat approval. So commissioners, y'all don't see this, but at the time of final plat, we get normally, we get a maintenance bond and that covers all the improvements for two years. It's basically a warranty. Then most of the time we get a performance bond for the uninstalled sidewalks and street trees. Those numbers are based upon what we call in the construction world SOVs, Schedule of Values. And that procedure is not captured anywhere. This makes it part of the subdivision regulations. So that way we have a standardized means of evaluating what we're receiving by the engineer saying, in other words, the engineer is the engineer is telling us 90% of the subdivision is built, they're bonding the rest, and he or she puts their PE stamp on it. This puts it in the subdivision regulations. And commissioners, this, la this next to last section right here, again, is some clarity about the ESRI ARC map shape files and the inspection videos that we get. We get video inspections of all the storm sewer and all the sanitary sewer piping. Um, something else that is not captured is that the actual roadway that we talked about on Mars Hill, for example, this is cross-referencing Chapter 19 of the City of Fairhope Code of Ordinances. That's where it says you need two inches of asphalt, two three-inch lifts of compacted sand clay base, et cetera, et cetera. We're cross-referencing the ESRI ARC map shape files in item number two. And then three, we're cross-referencing the standard specifications for constructing sanitary sewer facilities and water facilities. That's not mentioned anywhere in the subdivision regulations. It's very important to capture that 
and note it here because all of the test reports that are required by that we get at the final plat stage but we've basically been getting them we basically been getting them because the engineers have been on their honor on on the honor system and they're 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 submitting what they're supposed to submit um, very important that we capture that from a regulatory standpoint and then finally um, and then finally uh, the last item except where these regulations elsewhere provide for a waiver as to a specific matter waivers may be granted so as we talked about earlier the items now that can be handled as a review topic rather than a waiver that sentence allows that to work for the evaluating the sidewalks evaluating the lots not fronting on a paved road etc um, and so so Ken if I butchered that correct me no that's fine Buford I think we're missing one didn't we didn't we make some changes to the fire hydrant regulation yes we did yes we did we sure did so commissioners that's that uh, um, I apologize for that um, uh, Ken can you summarize that very briefly basically we just clarified um, about the fire hydrant and its proximity to a structure we made two as I recall I don't have my notes in front of me but I, I, I recall we made two changes or proposed two changes one would have tied the and we probably need to go back and visit it uh, some more but would have tied to, to John's point about the ordinance requiring the structure to be within 400 I think you said 400 feet John the uh, we inserted a phrase to, to indicate an intent that that there be a fire hydrant within 400 feet of not the lot but the building envelope in other words tie it more closely to the to the structure but we'll look at that again relative to to the ordinance John referenced and then we added a phrase I pulled the subdivision regulations of two or three uh, I would say maybe similar to larger size towns or cities in the state Tuscaloosa Prattville and maybe uh, somewhere over in the wiregrass and it's clear to me that that we and they borrowed language from somebody else when we drafted these because of their provisions were similar to ours you remember the last meeting we had a discussion about the fire authority whether they would have the ability to be less restrictive than the than the uh, regulation and I didn't read it that way one of those other cities actually says that he you know he, he can require it to be closer but not further away and so we borrowed from that to uh, to make the meaning of, of that provision more clear and, Ken, and, and commissioners that was a that question I had um, earlier oh, I'm sorry Connor, go ahead um, and I know John would uh, said the uh, authority having jurisdiction and, and Ken I'm asking you to kind of check into this because I don't believe that would be the volunteer fire department in this case. That would and be the Buf person under Buford and I discussed that, and you know, uh, you know, as much as we want, particularly in the, we want exactness and we want predictability, and those are the goals we we pursue when we write and, and try to implement the law. Some things are just inexact in life, including in in the law. Buford and I discussed this. I mean, what is the quote fire authority in in Fairhope or or in our ETJ? I mean, we don't have a fire department, do we? So we don't have a we don't. And so Ken, here's my understanding and interpretation. We don't have a municipal fire department. Obviously, we have a volunteer fire department. Um, so I'm not qualified to comment on their authority, um, but my understanding from conversations with Eric Cortinas is that he is the authority having jurisdiction within the within the permit jurisdiction, Permitting jurisdiction but permit that, jurisdiction that's not coextensive with our planning jurisdiction no sir no sir well, let's so, get into this more yeah later I think we're getting in the weeds a little bit but um, 
but I think you know we we can get everybody to read this and we've got a red line to make you know changes and you know have some group emails and later a meeting but I, I think a lot of these changes make sense I've got some concerns on a few of them that I'll you know that I'll let out um, and that's all it was intent or from my perspective Lee and I think Buford as well was you know, we've been talking about it, and we just wanted to get some proposed language on your radar screens. I think it's great. A a absolutely, absolutely. And and you know, and and the COVID situation certainly <laughs> delayed this. This is something we've wanted to do for several months, and um, and so I apologize for going so long, uh, Chairman. What uh, Chairman and Commissioners? I guess what I would ask is for the next steps. Um, would you is uh, something we can discuss here very briefly would it be beneficial to have either an ad hoc committee look at this and report back to the planning commission or possibly let's have a have a work session about this preceding a meeting or have a standalone work session um, those are just some just those are just some ideas I think we could have people email back their questions and concerns about these different issues and then decide which ones of these we need to have an ad hoc meeting on or talk further. I mean, a lot of these issues like the, you know, the ES, whatever it is, where they, you know, where the engineers give this stuff in, you know, some kind of AutoCAD form that y'all like. I mean, that's more y'all's business than us as a commission. But then I think issues like, you know, I've got a few issues like, I've always been bothered by whenever we have a final subdivision that it seems like everyone has 17 subject twos, and I wonder if we ought to just require rather than 90 percent, 100 percent of everything done. And so I'll send that in an email, and y'all may say, "Hey, here's the reason we have the 90 percent, and it makes total sense." Or maybe we just say, "Hey, you got to do 100 percent and take a lot of that language out of there." Um, I don't know that, and my brain's a little fried to get into it for you know right now. But I think we can send a lot of these things out via email, and then if there's some areas where, you know, especially if we decide we want to discuss with the family subdivision issues that, you know, we feel comfortable waiving, um, if it's a family subdivision subject to whatever reasons, like if somebody's already lived in a house for eight years, you know, and blah, 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 that will require that it doesn't be on a fronted street that a access easement's okay in that case. Then I mean those are the kind of issues we need to decide if we want to make exceptions to I think. And Lee, let me so, kind of share the my my concern that we're kicking this can too, and it's okay if we need we can debate this as long as possible, but if we send some emails, leave this meeting, send some emails back and forth, then we have to come to the, and, and then decide it's a work session. We have to wait till next month before you can initiate those. Then we advertise and all of those things that. That was the logic of you know, establishing an ag hot that can at least get together and That's be fine. Able to whatever y'all want to do, you know, we could break this down into bite sized pieces and you know, approve a lot of them next month and then have ad hoc on whatever we need to following. I mean, the difficult one is the family subdivision. Yeah, I mean, that one's nasty because, on the one hand, everybody wants you know, somebody to be able to give you know, the grandson some land, but on the other hand. You know, people take advantage of that. And take There's so many variables in that. And you change spots. one thing, and it changes the whole. So, intent, so. that's the one where I'm, I'm sure the family subdivision is one we definitely need to have some type of a committee to meet on. Okay. I mean, do y'all want to set that date later, or do you want to just go via emails and kind of see where the the areas that we want to pursue further and then set the meeting an ad hoc mm -hmm. meeting at the next meeting uh chairman yes how uh suppose we do this um the routine items the esri shape files that sort of thing uh mm -hmm. let's have them prepared for consideration next meeting those are the straightforward items get those done and out of the way um that way that way like you said we're we're, we're narrowing it down and making it into smaller pieces um, so unless there's some unless there's some objection there the, the straightforward routine items we'll have that ready for consideration at the July meeting that sounds good and then we can send emails and see where there's a lot of 
you know, concern, and then we'll schedule at the July meeting. We can then schedule an ad hoc meeting on the <coughs> on the other areas based on the information that we get back. Okay. Um, and what we can do is further refine. We'll further refine what we have that's not ready for consideration, report back to the commission in July, and then take it from there, hopefully with an ad hoc committee. Sounds good. All right. Is that the end of the agenda, I believe? We that is all I have, uh, commissioners. Hunter does have a zoning ordinance amendment discussion. And we're, we're going to hold off on that. Um, there, there's a few that we have that we'll kind of get through the big items for subdivision regulations. Okay. There's one more immediate, but I'd really like, because of our quarantine issues, I'd really talk, like to talk to the industrial board before we come back. And it's a pretty minor one about food processing, so... Um, no, not to get into detailed discussion tonight. Okay, sounds good. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you all very Thank much. You all. No. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good night.